Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslayers, a Doof Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. I am, am as always, your host, Constant Reader Scott Daly, and this week, my co-host Matt and I are podcasting from this metal outhouse. Matt, you, uh, you go in first. My eyes flash with thanks, Scott. Wait, there's no microphones in here. I'm betrayed. I was going to blind you, but from like a podcasting thing, it makes more sense to like like mute you yeah okay well this is gonna be awkward then <laughs> this week on the show we reach the end of book five wolves of the Kala. um in our calm before the storm eddie beats the shit out of a robot and callahan takes a quick trip over to maine then it's finally time for the wolves to come and our kata just just fucking just fucking kicks their asses totally um but in the post-battle confusion mia takes over Susanna and escapes through the unfound door there has to be someone who can help. Perhaps Stephen King? Matt, why, why not? What, what did you think about this week's reading? Uh, this is great. I mean, as promised, you know, it's it's this build up, this slow build up full of dread, all culminating in five minutes or, you know, a relatively short space of pages of, of, uh, of messy violence. And some people die, some people live. It's heart wrenching. It's victorious. Uh, Susanna slips away we're 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 happy we're sad we have all of the all of the emotions and i mean it's a great ending to a great book honestly yeah i mean i i have to admit that you know when i'm reading these books i'm reading these books from the analytical perspective which i think does like separate my emotional reaction from it because i'm i'm not just like sitting on the couch like casually reading right i have the book in front of me i'm highlighting passages i'm writing down notes like it's a different kind of reading but man, when Benny Sleitman died and Jake fucking just like walked down the road like that got me like that yeah. emotionally got me and I knew it was coming. And still, it's just like the emotion of the scene that the, the culmination of that moment is just really, really powerful. And I can't wait to, to talk through all of it with you and and what 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 it means that it happened this way and what King could be trying to say with this. Like I mean, all that aside, just on an emotional perspective. Huh, what an ending. Yes. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to like forget to talk about how hard hitting some things are because like you mm -hmm. said, it, it, there's a tendency to get really analytical when you're doing really long discussions about things. But yeah, absolutely. It, it, it hits hard. And it, it's also interesting how some things hit harder on on rewatch re or reread. Re, re like yeah. uh, me personally, there are certain scenes in Lord of the Rings where if anything, like the more times I watch it, the harder it hits. And um, I mean, I'm kind of a sucker for Lord of the Rings in the first place. Mm -hmm. But uh, but, but uh, you yeah. don't say you don't say Matt. Yeah. yeah. Shocking might revelation might have mentioned something along those lines. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's interesting what what uh, what what works that way and what doesn't. Uh, so that's that's cool. It's cool mm -hmm. that that works on that that works on you. Um, consistently yeah definitely um and it makes me excited for for the the emotional moments to come in these next two books so cool we'll, we'll see we'll see if those affect me in in similar ways um all right hey you want to just uh want to just get into it well, this is going to be a long it's a, it's a lot of pages and it's a lot to talk about so we might as well just get started because this is going to be a long one i think sounds good all right so begin with we begin with chapter six titled before the storm and and the the chapter itself begins with eddie and callahan once again in the doorway cave callahan is heading up to maine to arrange a meeting with tower and deep now and it looks like roland has wisely sat this one out or or well was it wisely i don't know we'll see right because i <sighs> yeah. mean like we we talked about this last week that like hey roland maybe you shouldn't be doing this anymore but like Eddie does it once and almost dies. Yeah, and also, you know, there, there's there's so much information being kept from people. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it seems like I don't know, man. It, it, it so one interesting <laughs> thing is like like there's a lot there's still a lot of secrets, mm -hmm. and we actually end the book with a lot of these secrets remaining. And and you know sure. one you know the, the the book the book that Roland saw is revealed by the end of this 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 book, but. A lot of stuff is not resolved, and I, I honestly am a bit surprised by that. I guess I felt like as we wrap this book up, we were going to wrap those threads up. Um, shouldn't surprise me that much because I mean, this is a series. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, 
yeah, I guess we'll I guess we'll just have to see how the chips fall. Yeah, I mean, and I think this book especially, um, because King had we talked about this when we started this book that that King wrote these final three books in rapid succession and and had basically plotted out the entire rest of the series at this point. He he knows where he's going going into this book, so I do think he feels a little bit more comfortable leaving a lot of these questions and mysteries open um, because he he knows he's going to get to them. Um, and, mm-hmm. and maybe perhaps if I was if I go back to back in time to what it was like reading this book when it first came out, the readers are, have a lot more patience for that as well, because it's not like you're going to be waiting six, ten years for the next book in the series. You know, it's coming. Um, he says right in the afterword of this book that the next one is already done. And the the one after that is almost done. So, mm mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess I am partially going off of the fact that all of the other books in the series have felt like they wrapped up in nice little bows um, a bit better than this one. Um, mm-hmm. and, and like you said, I think that is just because he's like, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. We're just we're, we're moving right along. So even even the wastelands, Matt, even the the Blaine, the mono cliffhanger. See, for me, that was that was like one thread that was a cliffhanger, like everything else about the book wrapped up. It was just okay, how are they going to get out of this situation? And then, yeah, it was absolutely a cliffhanger, but there weren't, there weren't a bunch of trailing questions, you know, not for me anyway, not sure. Not, sure. Not no, that I, I can remember. I think I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, one general thing I want to point out about this chapter is how many of those mini sections there are. Um, there are quite a lot of them in this chapter and it's not that long of a chapter. It's like, I think 20 pages or so. And so these mini sections are all very short and we're moving around a lot. We're jumping around a lot. And I think this kind of helps structurally build tension for like this, the final day, the the climax is coming and like we're jumping around and last minute preparations are being made and people are having to do many things and there's like time crunches. And I think these short little mini sections really help elevate that kind of that, that speed, that pace to, to the ramp up to the climax. Yeah, that makes sense. It definitely builds tension. Um, it, it's kind of like making all the final micro adjustments to your complicated Rube Goldberg machine just before you set <laughs> it into motion. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes for a really fast and exciting read. Um, I read, mm-hmm. I read this section pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, definitely. Uh, I don't think I stopped once I started it for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Before they get started with the whole door thing, though, Eddie notices something sewed into the lining of the bowling bat, some small rock-like thing. And then uh, the text here says, but Callahan was probably right. They had enough mysteries on their hands already. This one was for another day. And and I kind of love how King is basically saying directly to us, the reader, be intrigued by this new mystery I, I have just introduced to you, but don't worry about it too much right now there's other things to worry about it's not actually important to the climax of this book this is he's he's basically telling you that this is not important um right now but he can't help but do a stephen king right because right before callahan travels to the door king returns to the little object in the lining of the bag and drops this little bit for us but eddie forgot about the object in the lining of the pink bag it was Susanna who eventually found that and when she did she was no longer herself (laughs) <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh Stephen. Let, so let's talk about this for a bit because this is i mean classic stephen king once again is showing his hand in the most delightful way yeah and it's great i mean so first of all he didn't have to mention the rock or the pebble or the or the button or whatever it is i have no idea he mm-hmm. didn't have to mention it at all right it's really just an excuse for him to tantalize you with the future sure um the thing that jumps out to me about that line you just read is how precise king can be about this kind of thing Uh, you know i I like to dig into this kind of thing so like think about what this does and doesn't tell you it tells you that Susanna is still alive long enough to discover this rock thingy Mm -hmm. but it also tells us that it won't be our Susanna anymore it's it's i don't know is it mia um it doesn't actually say it's mia necessarily it could be some (laughs) other personality yeah that's fun the the word choice also to me implies that Susanna, as we know her, might just be gone as in not coming back because, you know, the language, it doesn't say when she found it again, she, she was not herself. It says she was no longer herself. Like to me, if you say like, Matt, are you wearing glasses? And and I say, I no longer wear glasses. That means 
my glasses wearing days are behind me. You know, like, like it's, it's <laughs> like I, that that's done. Right. So, but the thing is, it's also not, it's also just an implication. It's not a certainty. It's not sure. You could also use that wording more ambiguously. Yeah. So, so it's just vague enough to make you worried and uncertain, which I think is intentional. Yeah. I mean, I think the one thing it does in the short term is we know that, that probably Mia's is going to take over Susanna at some point. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we've got that in our head as we read through the rest of the chapter. And eventually we're going to pop over to a Susanna section where she's like, oh, yeah, just been having contractions for the past week. No big deal. And you're just like, oh, no, oh, no, there is there is something tragically inevitable about the Susanna part of the the climax of this book. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's like it's rough. Every time we check in with Susanna, it's worse. Yeah, uh-huh. uh-huh. pretty much for the whole book. Yep, yep. So Callahan pops into 1997 in the New York Public Library to nip a book of some Yankee highways. He's trying to get a picture for uh, for the zip code that he got last time um, to better visualize the place to travel to. Eddie keeps uh, butting heads with with the father, though, like they keep kind of bumping up against each other. And I particularly like this exchange right here. When he brings back the book, Eddie says, the father's a library thief. Eddie remarked, you're exactly the sort of person who makes the fees go up. I'll return it someday, Callahan said. He meant it. Uh, uh, so, okay, there's a lot to like here. First of all, like Callahan at the beginning of this novel and even most of the way through, like said flat out, don't call me father. I'm not a priest anymore. He was okay with pear, but he isn't a priest. He's not a priest. He doesn't want to be called a priest. He doesn't want to be called father. Eddie is now just calling him that. And it's in kind of like a, he's kind of poking, he's needling him a little bit. Um, and Callahan's not bothering to correct it anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they've moved, they've moved on from the like terse, serious phase of their relationship to the mm-hmm. earnest, uh, phase where Eddie can bust his balls a little bit. And, <laughs> and it's not like they've become great friends either. Right. Mm-hmm. It, but like they, <laughs> The the most recent interaction between them that I remember is Eddie being really annoyed that Callahan was was questioning whether he was serious about killing people's families. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm excited to see where their relationship goes from here. Um, you know, as Callahan joins the quartet, we need to understand, OK, what is his what is his relationship with each of these people? Because that was the cool thing about the quartet for me was like we knew we knew all we knew all of the vectors we knew Susanna's relationship with Jake and Eddie's relationship with Roland and Jake's relationship with Oi and and it, there were connections in all all possible directions so now we need to kind of connect up Callahan to the quartet and i think maybe that's part of the reason why king says you know what i'm going to send Eddie and Callahan off together so we can see how that pair is together yeah i mean i i think the the interaction where <laughs> Callahan saves Eddie's life is important to to mm-hmm. defining their relationship with each other um, right. that we hadn't hadn't really done in the past. Yeah. yeah. And I think they both bond over their shared annoying annoyance of Calvin Tower, which is, is lovely. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I, I do really like this little this little detail of he meant it, though, like I'll return it someday. He meant it like that's that's such an important defining mm-hmm. characteristic of the character like like roland i still remember that line he was the man that straightened pictures in empty hotel rooms like that mm-hmm. was such a beautiful image that, that that defined who he was as a person and callahan here is the man who will return library books he takes from two other universes like that's just the person he's gonna be he means it he's gonna do he's gonna return it yeah um i, I don't know that's such a powerful way of defining his character yeah it, it, it's simple and powerful yeah and isn't he legitimately dismayed when he finds out that a huge amount of time has passed like when he goes back through the door <laughs> yeah yeah I, yeah I i agree it's uh just very um efficient characterization mm-hmm. yeah i just i love it so much so callahan flips to page 119 in the book he stole and finds the East Stoneham Meeting Hall, which looks weirdly like the Cala Gathering Hall. It's twin, you could say. Uh, the similarities don't end there, though. The general store he goes into smells like Tooks, and the main dialect even kind of sounds like Cala speak. They say a yup instead of do ya, but otherwise it's it's quite similar. But uh, but it's it's more than just that too. People act like Cala folk too. They're friendly and helpful, good country folk. So once again, we have all this twinning in this book, this this powerful twinning that that it's going through everything, starting right from the beginning when we define 
two children, twins, as this important thing to the Kala. But now everything keeps there's everything's in twos. Um, and uh, why why do you think why do you think this, Matt? Um, so I mean, okay, so there's a couple things. <laughs> so first, I think I think this bit at least specifically is basically saying that Stephen Edwin King lives here and his impression of good country folk is based on these people, maybe even mm-hmm. these specific people. Um, and he invented his Kala speak uh, based on main dialect and so okay. on. So that, that's so why this. So you're going right to meadow with it. Like I'm going the, right the, to meadow with the specifics of what, why do people in Maine have Kala speak? That's yeah. So, so Kala Sturgis was created based on Stephen King's um, love of rural Maine is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, on I mean, just like if I'm going to write a rural setting, it's going to be rural Texas subconsciously mm-hmm. before I even think about it. And that's just sure. that's just my basis for it. Sure. But I also want to say that I think there's more to the, the idea of twinning in this book as a theme because mm-hmm. the book just has so much twinning. So, so yeah. I, I mean, OK, there's the there's this most superficial level of like we've got it. We got all the twins, we've got all the literal twins. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But then if if you just reach a little bit for it, there's. There's like there's Andy and Blaine as a kind of twin AIs who are separated by time. There's Jake and Kid 77 who are twins mm-hmm. in a kind of um, alternate history fashion. There's, yeah, I mean, you could even say Jake and, and Benny are are two sides of the same coin. Yeah, that's that that works maybe even better in some ways. Um, Mia and Susanna could be called twins. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you could you could slice Susanna in any number of ways. Um, so, so the book, the book loves dyads or duos. It loves taking a person and splitting them into two versions, um, or, or, or posing a reflection, uh, and then, and then asking, you know, an implicit, an implicit question to you by showing you this, which is always what made these two different and what makes them the same. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, I also think there's kind of a pervasive, like, there but for the grace of god go i tone or 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 feel mm. to it like like well what is the difference between these two characters kind of generically wave your hand over any any number of of characters in the story you could be like well it could just have been a single choice or a single thing that happened to them yeah happened to one of them and not the other you know in some cases there but for the curse of the devil go i because it was a terrible thing that happened to to one of them right um, yeah i mean this is this is kind of I have I have so much to say about Roland and Ben Sleitman um, when we get to those parts. And and this is right in line with all that. Right. Um, you could say that they are two sides of the same coin. Um, I mean, Roland specifically compares them and and notes their similarities and their one important difference here. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just to harp for one second more on this idea of like. um considering alternate possibilities as, as, a, as a lens of looking at this, like so much of the idea of the Dark Tower series is these are alternate worlds. What if this had happened instead of that? And, mm-hmm. and that's the mm-hmm. bifurcation of two levels of the tower or, you know, worlds or dimensions or whatever we call it. Um, and I, I'm starting to wonder if, if a big part of this idea might be rooted in uh, what would have happened if uh, a certain um, uh, fiction writer hadn't, gone for a walk on one particular june morning um along the along the roadside um and been struck <laughs> by a, a van um but uh but i don't know i that, that's that's a bigger thesis that i'm gonna have to build over time and, and we'll, we'll see okay. if anything plays into that yeah i would love to hear more about that but uh but yeah we can we can save that for another time okay um yeah i mean like textually in this story and again we're jumping all over the place and i don't care because it's the end of the book whatever um we are told specifically that twins have a power that is why that is why they are twins right like that is why the wolves are taking one of these twins there is some power between them that they are feeding to things called the breakers which we have a lot to talk about that um but and we will get there but so the the book is stating textually that there is power in this twin thing and it keeps creating these these dyads as you said i mean the biggest one i think is the tower and the rose right these are Mm -hmm. two things where we don't really understand fully what what 
the connection between these two things are, but we know they're related to each other. We know they're both extremely important, and we know that our, our Katet feels like they need to protect the one to save the other, and that's another dyad. And so, yeah, I mean, the the book is like screaming at us, like twins, 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 What this is important, this is important. And it is fascinating the ways in which that that plays out thematically. It takes the genre conceit and then plays it out thematically. And I think, in my opinion, most beautifully with Ben Sleitman and Roland Deschain. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, we'll but, talk but, about but, that when we get there. Yep, yep. I, I'm done jumping around. I'm sorry. Uh, Callahan finds out that Aaron Deep now left his name at the local post office because... <laughs> Calvin Tower is fucking terrible at hiding out. But hey, Matt, we can't get too mad because like that's the way they found him, right? Like they wouldn't have been able to find them either if they hadn't done this. So, you know, it's bad, but yeah. also good. It worked. It it worked. Uh, his 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 somewhat uh uh naive nature actually worked in their favor here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that continues to happen, you know, like Callahan he leaves them a note and instructs them to return um, a note to them with how to track them down. And uh, and and Callahan signs it Callahan of the Eld, which is which is really a really wonderful way of, you know, cementing him as part of the quartet. He says that Roland is the one that told him to do that. And so it shows that he's still kind of uncomfortable with the idea. Um, he doesn't feel like he should be. But but Roland has is firmly in the camp of, nope, you're part of this now. Sorry. Um and then the whole conversation ends with him like he can't help but chastise Tower via his postscript of the note for being stupid enough to leave his name and saying, don't come back to the post office, you fucking idiot. And <laughs> like, I love I love when people are mean to poor Tower because it's just wonderful. And it's like, as we were just talking about, everything he does seems to have a purpose behind it, right? Like, we know that the reason why he held on to the lot is because he's a person that just can't help but get obsessed with things and holding on to things. And that's the same thing that makes him put Aaron Deepnow's name on a list because he's got a book that he was trying to buy and he doesn't want to let the book go. Um, and and the, the same thing that that forces him to push this big collector's cart of books into the unfound cave, which ends up being pretty important because there's a pretty important book there at the end of the day, right? So like, it's all it's it's the worst tendencies that our characters can't stand in him, but they are in him to for, make him do things that end up helping our group. Yeah, right. Well, I, I think this is of a piece with a lot of our a lot of our quartet, really. Like, I think mm -hmm. I think that I think that in the end, Susanna's divided nature is going to be a pain in the ass. And it's also going to be something that helps them. And I think that, you know, Eddie's. Eddie's, you know, the fact that he's an addict, well, he, that that's kind of part of who he is, right? Or the, the fact that he's a, the fact that he doesn't take things seriously has already bailed him out at least once, mm -hmm. um, or, or that he has a silly way of looking at things. So, um, sure. yeah, like, like, like Callahan or, or rather Tower's flaws, you know, are being used for the good. And I think that's a cool thing. The story has done fairly consistently is kind of yeah. showing you how how things can, you know, the, the, neg the quote unquote negative aspects of a person's character can surprise mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I, I like it a lot. And it is interesting to me, like the ways in which Eddie is so annoyed by Calvin tower in, in similar, not entirely the same, but in similar ways to the way Roland was continuously annoyed with Eddieisms and in, in er the earlier books, right? The, mm. Eddie being himself, Eddie being, kind of uh cuff birdie um just continually like drove roland crazy and and it's like he's paying it forward now there's a new person here and <laughs> this guy's fucking annoying yeah yeah so callahan completes his mission and turns around to look back through the door and sees that eddie is gone see see matt eddie had been sitting there with the bullets in his ears while callahan was doing his stuff but the voices they uh they got in and they tell him he can fly to the tower. And Eddie almost does. He almost jumps off a cliff. And if it wasn't for a series of chance happenings, the book is propped. The book Eddie was leafing through the Sherlock Holmes book props open the box with black 13 in it. So the door doesn't close. Eddie's shirt didn't tear where Callahan grabs it because he's wearing a good Caliburn Sturgis shirt, a good, good craft. Um, he, he would have fallen. He would have fallen to his death. It was a good, <laughs> good chambray. Yeah. 
Yes, very good. Very good blue chambray shirt. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we talked last week, as we said already, that that why is Roland doing this? Why is Roland putting himself through this stuff over and over again? Perhaps this is why, because he can resist those voices in a way that the other characters can't. But let's talk about this, Ramona. Eddie, Eddie falls prey to Black 13's whisperings, where Roland does not. Why? Why does that happen? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I, I didn't really think too much of this at the time, but, you know, superficially, Roland has had a lot more experience with all this psychic shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Eddie maybe, you know, is more sensitive to it. Like, like he maybe he may have a little bit more more of the touch maybe um another framing is that hey maybe roland is falling prey to it but in a different way because yeah. it is making his dry twist much worse and maybe that's what it wants with him like it doesn't want to just kill him it wants to just kind of ruin him sure sure i like that i like that a lot um i i do think it it is it, it is fascinating <laughs> the way in which um eddie eddie is lured by the tower here right like Mm -hmm. the way black 13 gets into him and the way it succeeds in kind of hypnotizing him is promises of the tower which again i think goes to show how far eddie has come in his addiction right he has it's not i'll get you some more heroin it's not henry's voice henry's voice doesn't seem to affect him at all it's this this quest for the tower now that that he succumbs to Good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, I don't know, a a bit worrying for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have this quote. Roland listened carefully that evening as Eddie and Callahan recounted their adventures in the doorway cave and beyond. The gunslinger seemed less interested in Eddie's near death experience than he was in the similarities between Calibrin Sturgis and East Stoneham. He even asked Callahan to imitate the accent of the storekeeper and the post lady. Um, it's so fascinating, right? Like Eddie almost dies. Um, and yet all he cares about is, huh? Similarities. Yeah. Yeah. More, more rhyming, more 19. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Roland is either, either has this stuff figured out or is in the, like very much in the process of figuring it out because this whole book, he's actually been paying attention. Um, but keeping his conclusions to himself, like, like way back at the beginning of this book, he, he was intently listening to Eddie's ranting about everything going 19. Mm -hmm. Um, but whatever conclusions he came to weren't shared with us. So, you know, in the end, I wouldn't be surprised if he had it like 90% of the way figured out, you know, that, that being that they're in a book, that they're in a story. (laughs) Um, yeah, interesting. Even at this point. Now, there's a big assumption with what I just said there because, okay, yeah, they're in, a, they're in a book, but it's also possible that, you know, within this framing, the Dark Tower isn't fiction, but rather Stephen King is just a very special man with a psychic Shining-esque power of, of touching people in other worlds and channeling their stories. And so in this framing, Salem's Lot is real. The Dark Tower is real. Stephen King is just channeling these stories and writing them down and we're buying them and uh, assuming they're fiction. So we don't know, we don't know which of those options we're going with yet because we haven't got to that. But I feel like, uh, I don't know. I don't know which way it's going to go and, or maybe some other thing I haven't thought of. Yeah. And I guess, how do you feel about that? Now I'm not saying you're right or wrong. You know, I'm being, I'm being very, very chill here, but if pretending that you are right, like, how do you feel about the these books going in that direction? Like, kind of going in this direction. I mean, one way or another, like, Stephen King has just put his name in his own book in a way that he hasn't in the rest of the series, right? Like, Salem's Lot, at the end of this this book, Salem's Lot is a book, Callahan is a character, and, and we watch as the character freaks out about being a character in a book. So whether or not you're totally, completely correct with your opinion or not, like, how do you feel about King kind of making this thing more about him than it ever was? Well, it sort of seems like a, a logical step to take, especially for a Lord of the Rings fan. And and I don't I don't know how much of um how much of Tolkien's like ri- other writings and and other you know you know letters and stuff King had read back in the day. Probably I, I a lot so- of it. He, 
I am so like fascinated that. by where you're about to go with this. Please, please, I'm sorry. Please continue. <laughs> because Lord, Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien's whole idea is that every act of creation by a human being is an act of subcreation within the greater realm of God's creation. Because his, yes. his, his Catholicism very much influences his, his worldview. And so he mm-hmm. views what he did with Lord of the Rings as an act of subcreation, where it is creation, but it's a kind of a kind of facet of creation that he's he's you know ramifying he's he's improving and, and expanding upon mm-hmm. um and if king is familiar with this idea then he would view all of his all of his worlds or his big world if it is all the same world as being further sub creation and uh I think the idea of like, well, if this, if it really is a sub creation in some, in some meaningful way, if he's really created this, if he's really created these worlds, then, then what responsibility does he bear? <laughs> uh, does, does that make sense? Like, like, like if it yeah. was real, like, like if you knew that by putting pen to paper, you were making a real world, um, what does that mean? <laughs> does, that, does that mean you're <laughs> responsible? Does that mean he's responsible for, for Jack Torrance and and the uh, 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 the clown with the fucking clown's name Pennywise, um, yeah Pennywise, like like I don't know. I'm fascinated by this idea, and I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea if that's the direction this story is going. But as soon as I started thinking about it in terms of, well, he likes Lord of the Rings a lot. I couldn't help but think, well, he potentially sees this as a kind of universe that he's made, and and. Not just that, but a universe that is a sort of facet of our universe. So I don't know, Scott. Cool. I I, I love all of that. Um, no comment, but uh, I, I love it. I love I love that kind of thinking. And I, and I hope we get to do more of that as the the final two books roll onward. I hope we get to revisit it when you are allowed to talk about it so that you I mean, I think it would be fun to talk about even if I'm totally wrong. I think it's a cool idea. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think I think the final episodes of the show are going to be very fun when I finally cool. get to talk about everything, uh, even even the things that that the book did not talk about, but that you picked up on right or wrong. Yeah. OK, yeah, cool. Love it. Um, OK, so we cut back over to Susanna Dean and we see that she's not being honest. Um, she's been having contractions for the past week, but now they are worse than ever. And she's losing time again. You see here, it says when she, go- when she'd gone into the privy, her dark lady had stretched out nine in the morning long. Now she was saying that if noon wasn't here, it would be shortly. Uh, so this is great. And it's terrifying, but the use of dark lady as shadow here is so good. It's so good. It's so subtle. And like, it's one of those things that is just like, of course, of course, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. I love it so much. It's great. There's so much, there's so much in the Susan stuff specifically where just like a single word choice, like the chap, you know, or, or here, mm-hmm. the dark lady. It's like, oh my God, everything is so ominous. Her dark lady. You can't, God, just uh, imagine, imagine the sentence when she'd gone into the privy, her shadow had stretched out nine in the morning long. Now she was saying if noon wasn't here, it would be shortly. Like that's, it reads totally different. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's capital, capital dark lady. Yeah. Yeah. Her dark lady. Ugh, I love it. Fucking love it. Um, So Susanna begs God to give her three more days. That's all she wants. Three more days before anything happens because so she can help fight. And one thing that I think is really fun to track here is that how this begging switches here three days prior to the wolves, she's begging to God, trying to negotiate with God. Um, When it comes time for the day of the wolves, that negotiation and that begging switches to Mia herself. She's now begging Mia. She's now negotiating with Mia. Um, And I think that's a really fascinating switch because we're going from basically an all powerful deity, God help me to I recognize your power. Like she, she's almost declaring me the God of her, her body at this point. Like I recognize your power over me. Please, please cut mm-hmm. me, cut me some slack. You could also somewhat view it as lo- losing faith. Um, yeah, sure. She has been a very, she has been by far of the current Katet, the most, the most faith oriented, the most specifically Christian oriented. Yeah, but it's always been a struggle, right? Like mm-hmm. she she had that I, that beautiful quote of when she's arguing with her father, who mm-hmm. is completely cynical when it comes to 
uh, spirituality and religion um, and her trying to convince him. And I think over time, her her faith has been tested. And and probably like when we met her back in New York, back in um, the drawing of the three, she's probably like all time low, <laughs> all time low faith. Mm-hmm. Um and then maybe perhaps this experience has like reinvigorated a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe. But I feel but, like but, at this point, she's so desperate that it's probably dipping again. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. Like, like, yeah. like being pulled into the story, being pulled into this world and, and falling in love with Eddie and like having this experience and like, like bringing meaning to her life in a way that, that she hadn't had before. Um, and, and, and becoming whole kind of has maybe reinvigorated her faith in some sort of higher power, some sort of power beyond herself. I think it is interesting that like, she has always been kind of the one that was the least bought into the power of the tower and, and the power of this, like this whole thing and the importance of the quest. Um, she still hasn't seen the tower, right? Everyone else has seen the tower by this point. She has not. Um, and, and yet she is struggling with her faith as well. I, I I think that's really interesting. And I think you're right that the switch from God to Mia can be read in that kind of loss of faith. Mm -hmm. Um, um, switch of faith especially since like the thing inside mia is a demon that's what yeah. we're told so uh, a, liter- a literal agent of of the devil <laughs> or whatever you want to call it um yeah yeah there's there's a few ways we could be going with this right like i mm-hmm. think i think definitely this is the character that king has chosen to be th- the vessel he uses to talk about faith right we talked before about how she she has no direct experience of the rose or or the tower. She's never had the visions like the others have. She's never seen the rose like the others have. Um, and so her relationship with these concepts is purely through faith, um, with no yeah. no no evidence. And that's exactly the same as her relationship with God. It's it's all it's all faith. Yeah. Um, Gosh, I love that. I love that a lot. Yeah. And another thing that I just noticed is like as far as I can remember. I think this is the first time that Susanna or any of her personalities have actually like communicated directly. Like, like, cause she basically, she's just speak, she's speaking to Mia here and you yeah. get the sense, you get the very real sense that Mia has heard her and agrees, you know, it's a negotiation between her, her personalities. And I, I don't remember that yeah. ever happening before. I, I don't think so. I mean, cause uh, Odetta and Detta, you know, lived their lives without knowing each other until the very, very end. And it was the shock of seeing each other that it was part of combining into Susanna. Right. So there was not really opportunity for them to, to chat amongst themselves. So yeah, this new personality represents this new thing. Um, it is interesting <laughs> not to get too crazy here, but like the Cotet has a new member join it, who is a person of, of faith, of religion, of spirituality in, in Callahan. Um, Mia's or Susanna's cotet of Odetta, Detta, and Susanna also in the same book has a new person join it, who is a person of um, the opposite of spirituality and faith, mm-hmm. and, and like literally the opposite. Um, yeah, That's, more more duality. Yeah, more more mirrors and and balancing mm-hmm. of forces. Yeah, yeah, love it. Cool. So we jump to a day later as Tian and Eddie prepare. To fuck with Andy, which is my favorite game and their favorite game as well. Um, they're having this conversation before Eddie shows up or uh, Andy shows up, though. And this is really fascinating. And I want to spend some time on this, Matt, because they basically get into medicine and how Tian views health and the human body. Uh, he basically says there are only three boxes to a man, the head box, the tit box and the shit box, basically thoughts, emotions, and then the low Kamala stuff. Um, And the quote here is is really great. In the last box is what we'd call low Kamala. Have a fuck. Take a shit. Maybe want to do something, someone a meanness for no reason. And if you do have a reason? Oh, but then it wouldn't be a meanness, would it? Tian asked, looking amused. In that case, it'd come from the heart box or the head box. That's bizarre, Eddie said. But he supposed it wasn't. Not really. In his mind's eye, he could see three neatly stacked crates. Head on top of heart heart on top of all the animal functions and groundless rages people sometimes felt. He was particularly fascinated by Tian's use of the word meanness, as if it were some kind of behavioral landmark. Did that make sense? Or didn't it? He would have to consider it carefully, and this wasn't the time. So all this is fascinating, and I, and I want to talk about it for a while, but eventually I, I do want to get back to 
why Stephen King is having his characters discuss this now, right? Um, not only this is important, and, and I want to talk about what this says about Stephen King and what this says about evil in the Stephen King universe, but but on top of that, why are these characters having this conversation now? Why mm-hmm. now? Yeah. I mean, for sure, my brain just slammed on the brakes here because as you implied there, the idea of pointless meanness as being its own separate category, um, you know, grouped in together with lusts and base pleasures, it fits so well with our little cosmology of how King portrays evil that we've, yeah. that we've talked about and that the, the, the readers talked about in their answers to the discussion question a few months ago. You know, and, and we've seen how sex, pain, violence and magic are tied together many times in the story. Mm-hmm. You know, all all the all of the low Kamala stuff is is bound up together with magic here. Um, as for why we're talking about it now, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe King just wants to be a bit more um, literal with with these ideas that he's because because they've been they've been there the whole time, literal literally from the beginning. The, these mm-hmm. ideas have been there. I think I think, um, um, and maybe this is you know the dark tower this is sort of his magnum opus right maybe he wants to be like all right look we're going to actually we're going to actually talk about these ideas now we're not just going to background them yeah i mean i th- i think you're right i think that's absolutely true i do think like in the context of what's happening in the book they're about to confront andy 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 the messenger robot many other functions right what what is Andy doing and like which, which part of the choices that Andy is making or, or not making could be called, you know, head box, heart box or shit box. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like, like Andy seems to take great pleasure in the ways he fucks with people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and while he has motivations for what he's doing, most of what he does, it seems on a day to day basis is just like enjoying messing with people and, and enjoying the fact that they don't know that all this time he is the instrument of their destruction. Um, and that seems very shit boxy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, sadism is the more dressed up word for it, right? He, he, he enjoys their suffering. He, he literally yeah. said like he, he likes to tell them news of the wolves because it upsets them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the, uh, how much of his behavior just comes from meanness from just meanness. Mm-hmm. And then you have a character like Slightman, um, who is, is a very complicated, fascinating character who is doing terrible things and, and yet he has reasons for it, right? Like if you do have a reason, right? Like it, what we call look, have a fuck, take a shit, maybe do, maybe want to do someone a meanness for no reason. And if you do have a reason, okay, well then that wouldn't be shit box. That would be head box or heart box. Right. And that is, those are the things that I think Slightman is operating in. And that's why like he is not depicted as the Stephen King, unquestionable evil monster person. He's depicted as the weakness of man. And, and I think this is so important. And I think King is, is, showing us this now because we're about to have to watch this confrontation between Slightman and and Roland and we have to kind of like figure out how we feel about it because it's complicated like Mm. what what we what we feel about Ben Slightman and 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 the choices he made and what he did and and the place that he ends up at the end of this book is a lot and I think it's there's a lot it's saying a lot especially about Roland himself and I think defining these these motivations for the things that we do and mm-hmm. and it's not saying like you can do a bad thing because you thought it was the rational thing to do right you can do a bad thing because you were wound up in your emotions and you can do a bad thing just because you just wanted to you just mm-hmm. don't no reason just wanted to and and so it's not saying that like the things you do in the head box are are all good things no this is like you could this is all bad behavior you could do but it is it it matters which box it comes from yeah. i think yeah i like that i i think uh king's definitely kind of giving us a bit of a vocabulary for talking about okay why why do we why do we condemn andy and why why are we relatively happy to see him buried in a hole uh versus why do we kind of still feel bad for slideman mm-hmm. even even though he did just as bad things as andy yeah um yeah 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 i love it i love it so much Me um too. 
So Eddie's thoughts about this whole thing, though, are interrupted by Andy showing up laughing at these foolish gunslingers and their stupid plans. And delightfully, they proceed to bullshit him about some giant hundred pound guns that they've snuck in from Callahan's level of the tower that will surely turn the tide against the wolves. And they need Andy's help to move them. This whole thing is just so delightful, man. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Right. Seeing seeing Andy just get so excited about the idea that he's going to just fuck up their plans. Um, mm-hmm. It is delightful, but I was very nervous because like, I felt like it would be, I felt like there was a good chance that Andy would sniff out their deception. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was, I was nervous during this bit. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's been so long since I've read this for the first time that I don't remember if i was nervous or not i know i knew that andy does not sniff out this deception so i just got to enjoy it on the level of ha 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 this idiot yeah no it it really um i mean like specifically the part where they're walking him into the into the room and eddie is like still talking uh no no no. what happens is they walk him into the room and, and eddie like starts basically taunting him before he's shot his eyes out or anything and i'm just like Mm -hmm. oh my god shoot him before you taunt him eddie (laughs) he's gonna he's you don't know how fast he is he could just turn around and rip your head off Um, yeah everything turned out fine obviously yeah 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 yeah. i do love like there is we cut from this kind of joy of getting one over on andy to the existential dread of jake chambers in his final night with benny slightman um which as it turns out is one of benny slightman's final nights alive um and we get this really really wonderful quote the prospect of standing against the wolves was bad enough the thought of how benny might look at him two days from now was even worse maybe we'll all get killed jake caught thought then i won't have to worry about it in his distress this idea had a certain attraction yeah the, like i don't know I, maybe this is just me maybe this is just me there have been moments in my life where i was really really super dreading something and I'm just like, maybe I'll break my leg and have to go to the yeah. hospital. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll get really, really sick. Maybe I'll die. Yeah, <laughs> like, maybe, like, And then yeah. I don't have to worry about it. And it's completely illogical. And you don't actually want any of those things to happen, right? But it just shows how much you're dreading this this thing that's coming. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I felt this to my core. For sure. Yeah, very relatable. Yeah, I, I think... Because even even if you don't seriously want to die, you can relate to the idea of like, well, that sure would solve the problem, though. And it feels yeah. really bad right now. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, he doesn't he doesn't want to die, but he's like, I could die tomorrow. Maybe. And maybe it'll be better if I do. Yeah. Um, no, instead, your friend that you're worried about will die. And that's mm-hmm. it's awful. Yeah. So Benny is just like being a kid. He's thinking about the battle to come. He's talking about how many wolves Jake is going to kill. 20, 20 wolves he's going to kill. Benny has a child's excitement, but Jake has an adult's dread. There's no badass romantic mysticism about what they have to do in Jake's mind. They will fight. They might die. And even if they will win, he's probably going to ruin his friend's life forever. And I have to read this whole section, Matt, because it's so good. He found himself thinking, with a mild sense of wonder, of Miss Avery's English class, the hanging yellow globes with ghostly dead flies lying on their bellies, Lucas Hansen, who always tried to trip him when he was going up the aisle, sentences diagrammed on the blackboard, beware the misplaced modifier, Petra Jesserling, who always wore A-line jumpers and had a crush on him, or so Mike Yanko claimed, the drone of Miss Avery's voice, outs at noon, what would be plain old lunch in a plain old public school, sitting at his desk afterward and trying to stay awake. Was the boy, that neat Piper school boy, actually going out to the north to a, of a farming town called Calibrin Sturgis to battle child-stealing monsters? Could that boy be lying dead 36 hours from now with his guts in a steaming pile behind him, blown out of his back and into some dirt by something called a snitch? Surely that wasn't possible, was it? The housekeeper, Mrs. Shaw, had cut the crusts off his sandwiches and sometimes called him Bama. His father had taught him how to calculate a 15% tip. Such boys surely did not go out to die with their guns in their hands, did they? <sighs> yeah, it's 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 a great it's great. Everything about Jake is great. Um, mm-hmm. My favorite bit here is that is that his dad teaches him to calculate a fifteen percent tip because <laughs> Jake's father, big shot executive who had, can afford to send his kid to private school, he tips, but he tips the minimum acceptable amount. 
fucking cheap ass. <laughs> fucking cheap ass. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. But I mean, this is like he's this is a kid, you know, all, all book. And we've said this when it were episode eight of this book. So at least 16 times we've said this. This this is a kid who is is yo-yoing back and forth between who he was and what he is becoming. And in this moment, you know, in the calm before the storm that is the climax of this book, he's sitting here looking at where he was and where he's going now. And it's unbelievable. Like, this was my life before. I, w- I would go to school. Um, I, there's like my biggest worry was like this guy is picking on me and um, this girl has a crush on me uh, and, and lunch was kind of boring and I'm struggling to stay awake after after lunch because I'm bored like and now look at me now look at me i'm going to march out north i'm going to fight monsters and i'm going to possibly die how how did this happen this this how surely such boys did not go out to die with guns in their hands this is not what my life was and and he's just he's just not fully dealing with the truth of that yet mhm yeah it is really interesting jake is at least in terms of age, the closest thing we've got to our YA protagonist. Mm-hmm. Like like in a normal fantasy series, Jake would be the protagonist because he's the kid and he would be the chosen one and he would have the magical powers that he needs to master so that he can, um, you know, uh, go go out there and slay the, sl- sl- slay the, the Crimson Kings because he's the hero. Like that's, that's how this would go in a normal fantasy series. Um, but that's not what's happening. And in fact, our, our, our young character is, is struggling by far the most with just the, um, improbability of all of this, right? Like, like, uh, like Eddie doesn't struggle with this. Eddie, Eddie's pretty, pretty totally bought in on the whole idea of, um, okay. Yep. It's, it's weird. There's other worlds, there's doorways. It's, It's all, it's all pretty wild, but, um, other than some of the 19 stuff, I think he's, he's just kind of rolls with it. Whereas even, even now Jake is still um, having a hard time accepting that this is his reality. And I think yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. It is, it is. And, and like, if you were like hypothetically adapting this story into a movie, the one thing you surely wouldn't do was make Jake into the YA protagonist character oh, right God. like like that's that's the one oh, thing Jesus. you definitely would not do right no why yeah god no no i'm not there's no reason i'm saying that just uh, <laughs> it's so obvious now i understand everything <laughs> so jake has a dream matt uh-huh. <laughs> and in this dream we see roland was down on his knees in the dust of east road facing a great horde of oncoming wolves that stretched from the bluffs to the river he was trying to reload but both of his hands were stiff and one was short two fingers the bullets fell uselessly in front of him he was still trying to load his great revolver when the wolves rode him down wow what a dream yeah it's always interesting to me how the story uses dreams because very often they're downright misleading you know like i remember back in wizard and glass um if not before that it might have been in the wastelands where you know we're, we start getting dreams about oi being killed first he's going to be hit by a, a train and then he's going to be impaled on a tree and you know i mean maybe oi will still die in this story but we're so far removed from those dreams that they don't really work as like foretellings of of things that are eminently going to happen um, yeah, yeah. so and again this doesn't happen either so it's just interesting to me because normally in a story when you see a dream you're like oh no some version of this will happen and actually yeah. it very often does not in fact maybe usually does not if it's just kind of a normal dream yeah i mean in, in my opinion there are two things you can do with dreams in stories you can make them prophetic or you can just allow them an interiority into your characters that they are not willing to consciously go to. And I think this is more the latter Um, because I I think like Jake has picked up on Roland's dry twist and he hasn't possibly done it consciously yet, but he has picked up on it. And that's why he's seeing both of his hands were stiff, right? That this is, this is his all, this is the, 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 um, the twist yeah, Destro- that ha- that has destroyed his functionality and and has led to his death here. Um, he's also alone, right? There's no one else around him. He's alone, trying to reload and and gets ridden down. So this is, I mean, I think 
Jake has sensed something wrong with Roland um, through the touch or just through being observant. And he's that that fear of this thing that he has sensed is playing itself out in his subconscious. Um, and we're getting to see that here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's cool. Um, something that jumped into my mind just now, which is very Tolkien related, is, you know, if if according to Tolkien, evil is that which is its own undoing the evil is that which destroys itself ultimately and if andy hadn't been so eager to twist the knife by telling them that the wolves are coming way in advance so that they can be extra scared um then they wouldn't have known the wolves are coming and they wouldn't have gone to find gunslingers to help them yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, there is there seems to be no practical reason to do that except for the joy of scaring them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's I mean, it, it doesn't give them any advantage. The wolves, if there was no forewarning, the wolves would just sweep in and take the kids. That would be it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it, his own his own desire to be an asshole, his own his own his own low Kamala um, is what is is what resulted in his own death and the death of all the wolves. I love that. I love it. All right. At dawn on Wolves Eve, Eddie and Susanna spend some time together declaring their love for each other and then making love. And I don't have a lot to say here other than the scene becomes heartbreaking when you know what's coming. Um, Eddie Dean, Susanna says he makes her whole. And, And I love this one part. I love this quote Eddie says here. It's good to make someone glad. He said, I didn't used to know that. Um, that's such a powerful sentence there, Matt. Like, I didn't used to know that. I didn't used to know how good it is to make someone else happy. Yeah. That wasn't my life before. And, yeah, and I've, I've found that now. Yep. Yeah, simply beautifully stated. Um, mm-hmm. and I mean, I have to say like, for me, I hope I'm wrong, but this has the feeling of this is maybe the last time, maybe the last time ever that they're mm. going to be together. Um, hope it's not true, but it, it, the way it's written, it kind of feels that way. And that makes me even sadder. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I do think King wants you to be thinking that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it works in the moment because we don't know who's going to live and who's going to die the next day. Right. Mm-hmm. So it works as just, we could die tomorrow, but it also works as, coming back on a reread knowing that by the end of this book Susanna will be gone um yeah yeah right so then we we do another cut over and it's to Roland and Rosalita doing their thing in the calm before the storm and and I love this quote are you tired Roland to death said he like Roland's so tired (laughs) Roland's so tired of life of everything of doing of this quest like he's just so tired and you just really feel for him in that moment I think Mm -hmm. absolutely and then she does say to him these a good man Roland of Gilead he considered this then slowly shook his head all my life I've had the fastest hands but at being good I was always a little too slow whoo yeah, yeah, he never seeks absolution, but he does know the score. Or does yeah. he? <laughs> Cuz oh. you know, he is risking his life to save the town, right? He didn't mm-hmm. have to do this. Like we we've we've both been all aboard the dumping on Roland train this month, I think. Um, but sometimes it's good to remind ourselves that maybe he's not giving himself credit where he deserves it cuz I mean, this act, his actions in this book are pretty darn heroic i mean he uses some ugly tactics here and there but they're all instrumental in saving all these kids so so come on roland go easy on yourself i i I think there's a there's a a good point to be said in that that roland's the bad things roland does and the bad choices that roland makes he always falls back on this concept of ka on this concept of i didn't have a choice like this is i I am i am cursed by this thing that dictates my actions but the flip side of that is every time he does something heroic and wonderful he minimizes it as, as well because it's the same thing right like i have to do this like saving the town i have to do that like the, i i didn't have a choice and he so he minimizes the bad things that he does but he also minimizes the good things that he does it all falls back on this this mystical force that is not giving him a choice in the matter so mm-hmm. i think you're right like he is he is both uh he is both his worst critic 
and and um the the person that is like uh, i can't think of the word but like he's the, the absence of a cheerleader <laughs> sure, sure i don't like, know I, I don't know yeah i mean just to jump ahead slightly he doesn't give himself any single moment of like feeling happy that he saved all these kids you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, uh yeah right i i like i like this idea that you know the flip side of using ka to kind of forgive your sins in a certain sense it also means you don't get to take credit for your successes yeah yeah absolutely like no one no one gets credit for remembering the face of their father (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i like that i like that it's it's so funny though because like in what way is ka responsible for for this like he could have just been like no i'm sorry I'm, i'm sorry uh uh father callahan uh we're we're going to the tower um gotta go to the tower it's more important than your town bye Mm -hmm. and then they could have just gone on this is his choice it's not it's i don't see yeah i don't know i I agree i mean i I think it's a little more complicated than that i mean i think there's a lot wrapped up in everything happening in new york city and and their time in the cala has given them the tools they needed to try to deal with that um so like th- there's there's importance in being here beyond just saving the people but um saving the people was was always kind of like it, it, it interestingly enough it was both the main plot of this book and the least important thing to all of our characters <laughs> yeah i don't know i'm still confused about ka because it's almost like when you when you go against ka that's still what ka wanted you to do yeah. And when and when you when you think you're doing what Ka wants, but you're doing the opposite, that's actually still what Ka wants, paradoxically. Yeah. Um welcome to Catholic teenager Scott trying to figure out what the hell free will and God's plan have uh-huh. can like I, I've never been able to square that in my head because it is inherently contradictory. So Yes. It's it's literally a paradox designed to make you sort of stop thinking <laughs> <laughs> well that's an extreme an extreme reaction well i'll just i know i'll I know just leave that there and move on with the conversation then <laughs> i know what you mean um so eddie leaves uh, the digging um oh wait I, I missed i missed something so later that afternoon the final day the group is out digging ditches we don't quite know what they're for yet and and but they're, they're talking and they're talking about the dust storm that's coming in that might threaten to hurt their effectiveness. If the wind's blowing too much, the Arizas won't fly very well. But Per Callahan once again shows his faith not just in God, but in the world, as he correctly indicates that the storm is going to blow right back from where it came. And I, I, I love this because I love this as a symbol of how the battle itself will go, right? Like, Callahan's looking out and he sees the coming storm and he's just like, don't worry, it's going to go back. It's going to be pushed back. And that's kind of exactly how the fight goes. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I I do like that. So Eddie leaves the digging to meet up with Tian and Andy. Um, and, and in this moment, he he says he wondered if all the thinking machines that still worked in this rundown world had turned against their masters. And if so, why? Indeed. Indeed, Eddie. Uh, I mean, it's especially relevant upon learning that the wolves are also robots. Like, mm-hmm, like, like mm-hmm. do they have a good, like, like a, like a reason? Like, cause we don't know what it is. If so, I mean, that's one thing we never really understood about Blaine, like b- beyond just, oh, he went crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I will say that it seems like Andy and the wolves are, are working directly for someone in a way that Blaine was not. We don't know who yet. We, we know there's some, some guy uh in uh um i forgot the name of the place but yeah sounds like minas morgul is all i remember <laughs> yeah al ghul al ghul siento siento yeah. yeah yeah but we don't know who those people are um yeah and we we, we do get the why of it all but uh mm-hmm. we get the why of it but it's it feels like a partial answer still um, sure yeah we'll see So the two of them trick Andy into the privy with its brand new lock installed. And then when his back is turned, Eddie pulls out his guns and blinds Andy, the messenger robot, less other functions now. Uh Um, Let's talk about the blinding, though. I think blinding has such a powerful imagery, not just within the story with within, you know, Andy's eyes have been the source of of menace 
for for so many chapters now and and removing those things is is the defeating of this kind of laughing to himself evil robot but also just in literature like the use of of blinding of someone in punishment has very powerful connotation yeah it's very mythological right yeah yeah um yeah it's um it's great it's a great uh great and terrible moment i love it Mm -hmm. i i do think that like blinding at least biblically as was seen as a punishment for betrayal Mm -hmm. um so i think i think that's like that's where this is fitting rather perfectly is that like andy has betrayed them all and his punishment is to have his sight taken away Mm -hmm. um the Bible loves to use use blindness both as as the power of God to cure and also uh, causing it. Um, I'm pretty sure our old friend uh, Solomon was was blinded at some point. Okay, um, well, it's a very visceral idea. I mean, I, I I I do. It would be interesting to 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 kind of understand how King thinks through like the I don't know maybe the the low kamala aspects of how he deals with a with a piece of shit character like this because like mm-hmm. we're we actually feel pretty satisfied like all right yeah blind him and then bury him in shit perfect <laughs> this is exactly yeah. what this guy deserves and and you're like well that's that's pretty dark actually you know i mean like i don't think there's anything wrong with enjoying a bad character getting a a, a vicious punishment like doesn't make you a bad person but also mm. I think that it is good to kind of reflect on like why why is the author going for this particular effect and and, and how are they doing that and um um yeah I mean it's a v- extremely uh uh I'm just going to use the word visceral again extremely visceral like way way of uh dealing with this this character because you could what well, you could just like crush him with something right you could 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 cut his head off or something right it's like there, there's a lot more sort of there's a lot there's a lot of ways you could solve this problem that don't involve such a kind of horrific seeming fate. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I uh, it the, the death of Andy is both immensely enjoyable and then like weirdly sad. Like when mm-hmm. he when he basically begs for his life at the end. Mm-hmm. Um it's like, "Oh wow, okay." Yeah. Yeah. Why do I feel bad for this guy at, at this moment? Yeah, right. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, I talked I talked last week I think about how this is the first time I've sort of felt anything for one of these robots. Mm-hmm. So once they've got him locked into the privy, Eddie goes to enter the password. It's not nineteen, as we already know, but then it's not ninety nine either, which the, Eddie was absolutely convinced it would be. And then we get this moment: what flashed in his mind, as bright as Andy's eyes had been before Roland's big revolver turned them dark, was the verse scrawled on the fence around the vacant lot, spray painted in dusty rose pink letters: "Oh, Susanna Mio, divine girl of mine, done parked her rig in the Dixie Pig in the year of." And then Eddie thinks, "Not one or the other, both," which was why the damned robot hadn't cut him off after a single incorrect try. He hadn't been incorrect, not exactly. Nineteen ninety nine, Eddie screamed through the door, and of course it works. It is the password. Nineteen ninety nine. Matt, uh, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, as I sort of fumbled my way around a few weeks ago, nineteen ninety nine is when the Phantom Menace came out, and it's like <laughs> roughly when Harry Potter came out. And I thought I was onto something there. Um, but I think most relevantly, uh, 1999 is the year that Stephen King was almost killed by by a car. Uh, June 19th, 1999, actually. So. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. But that's real life, though. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that actually is true, though. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if you take the interpretation that Stephen King is creating this world, well, that's the year that the universe was almost destroyed. Total coincidence. Okay. Once the password is unlocked, Eddie orders Andy to shut down, who, after begging his life, begging for his life, rather, eventually complies. And thus, Andy, the messenger robot, dies just like Shardik did, wailing his last warning as loud as possible. Yep. The manner of his death, um, um, uh, is so identical to that of uh, Shardik, like mm-hmm. in terms of the wailing and the the exact same like things that he says. 
so identical that we can only really conclude that they were made by the same people and probably at around the same time, maybe. Yep. Good old North Central Positronics, just making some beam guardians and some Andy robots and maybe some wolves too. Yeah. I feel like that's that's one thing where I, I don't I don't quite see where North Central Positronics fix it fits in with like the Crimson King and the vampires and all this stuff. Like mm-hmm. or or even if it does. But I'm very curious about this. Okay. Well, maybe we'll find out one day. The chapter ends with Roland watching the Kala prepare their last supper, as it were. And I really love the writing here. Every one of them knew it might be the last meal they'd ever eat together. That tomorrow night at this time, their nice little town might lie in smoking ruins all about them. But still, they were cheerful. And not, Roland thought, entirely for the sake of the children. There was great relief in finally deciding to do the right thing. Even when folk knew the price was apt to be high, that relief came. A kind of giddiness yeah i think one of my favorite parts of this book has been tracking the psychological evolution of of these people as they you know first they came to grips with and then they accepted the reality of the choice they had made you know all the various stages of of going through that and it all just struck me as like very relatable and very realistic yeah i I totally agree it's such they're they're never the focus of this story but King, because he can't help himself, characterizes so many of the people of this town. And we see their struggle and we see them get to a point where they're all not only willing to do this, but excited to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, without going too much into the weeds, I, I do read a little of this, what Roland is saying here, him talking about himself, right? Um, it feels good to finally decide to do the right thing. And this is a thing that, that, you know, we, we said Roland doesn't give himself credit for this kind of stuff and he doesn't, but this is, you know, defending a, a group of people from the evil monster robots coming to take their children every 20 some years is unquestionably the right thing to do. And, and in Roland's long history of bad and tough choices, this is one of the easier ones, right? Like, the, the, there are no moral qualms to shooting these stupid robots in the head mm-hmm. and 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 stopping them from s- kidnapping children and turning them into into you know basically brainless people mm-hmm. that that die early um and so like I, I do read some of he's not exactly giddy here but i do read some of this as him thinking to himself about how i am i am this is this is the right thing what i'm doing here it is the right thing and I don't have to f- worry about that for once. Yeah, I, I like that interpretation. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then we get this cool moment where, where our good old pal Wayne Overhosen shows up to tell Roland he's switching sides again. And he's volunteering to help out in the battle to come. I love like his little arc he goes through in the story. He, he's, he's a big part of the early story. And then he kind of disappears. But you can kind of tell that even if it doesn't explicitly say it, like you can kind of tell that he's been having this this struggle in the background yeah. um, throughout everything. Yeah, absolutely. We don't get a lot of specific insight into him during this time, but but you know that he's struggling. You know that there's there's fear, there's a sense of duty, um, there's there's obligation to his neighbors, there's guilt, um, mm-hmm. all sorts of stuff that we don't really see it, but we we just infer it, and we yeah. you know we we know it's there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Then our Katet goes off to bed. No more smiles, no more lies. It's time. It's time, Matt, Mm -hmm. for lead. All right. All right. So we move on to chapter seven, fittingly titled The Wolves. And one thing I think King really excels at, of, of the many, is how to take command of a moment. The entire last chapter was these quiet bits leading to the final confrontation. This chapter, like we said, fittingly titled The Wolves, as if, and, 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 and he signals to the reader at the start of this chapter with such, such a powerful statement, see this now, see it very well. He doesn't just describe the scene of the bucka wagons driving up the road, stuffed with children and their protectors. He first speaks to us. The narrator speaks to us, the reader, and says, I am going to set the scene. See it. Imagine it. Here it is. It it makes everything feel more important, more impactful. See this now. See it very well. This is the moment. This is the scene. See it. Um, I I just I love it. Like it's 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 a small little thing, but 
it just it changes the tone immediately when you turn that page into this chapter. For sure. It's interesting how vocal the narrator has been in this book um, mm-hmm. in general. And uh, it's also really cool and fun how the narrator is using the voice, you know, the voice of the Cala Falcon, the, yeah. the, the Cala Falcon, sorry. Um, see this now, see it very well. It's such a great, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It's weird to me how much I love the, the, the mid world speak and the Kala speak and, you know, the, the thank you sign all that. Like I didn't expect that going into this, that there's very few things in life that I've in, 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 you know, in, in reading where I've been like, Oh, I just, I want, I wish, I wish that everyone spoke this way in real life, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it has that weird effect on you. And we've kind of talked about this before and that like it's so simple and recognizable, even if you don't know it. Mm -hmm. Um, But there are very few of the big stories I've read where I've thought that thing. And this is absolutely one of them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's there's uh, every fantasy series has its own kind of dialect. Every sci fi series has its own kind of things that they say. But for whatever reason, this is one that gets in my head. Um, And I think it's because there's so much character behind all of it that it just it seems just so fitting um and and i don't know king's just really good at this kind of shit like you have forgotten the face of your father it's just it's a cool it's a fucking cool thing to say to someone yeah it's great i can't argue Mm -hmm. all right so before the wolves come there's the the wolf in sheep's clothing that they had to deal have to deal with. Ben Sleipman, sitting in the wagon next to Roland, finally addresses the elephant to the room. He says, what will he do to me then? And that starts the conversation. And this conversation is quite possibly the most important thing in this book, Mac. Not the wolves themselves, not Calvin Tower and the Rose, but this conversation and how it will define our characters and what's what's going to happen. Yeah, I think you're right. It's it's the emotional crux of the book. So, mm-hmm. so much of Jake's journey hinges on it. So much of sort of the, um, you know, what are we trying to say about the nature of this whole situation? It, I think it can be bound up with like, okay, well, what are we going to, how are we going to respond to this, to this one man who has in a sense made the choice that everyone else in the Kala has made? except he's made it in a, in a, in a remarkably selfish and, and traitorous way to treacherous, mm-hmm. tre- treacherous way. Right. Cause like e- everyone, and again, I, I go back and forth on this a lot, but like everyone in the Kala has chosen the status quo over drawing a line in the sand and, and, and fighting. They've all made the same choice. He's just gone a step further. He's actually, you know, literally said all right this is where the kids are going to be you know he he's an he's an active agent rather than a passive agent um so us you know us the reader and the characters in the book sort of deciding how we feel about this guy is kind of the hinge point of how we're supposed to feel about all of this i think yeah i think you're right i think you're right um, and, and the conversation starts off with this, and I, I love this so much. Roland asks the other question. If Sleipman answered in the negative, he wouldn't live to see the coming of the wolves, no matter how fast their gray horses rode. If you found him, Sleipman, if you found my boy, this is in the Dogen, would you have killed him? Answering in the negative here would mean death because it would be a lie, right? He would immediately know Sleipman was lying again. Um, and, and that kind of gets to... Once again, the importance of secrets, the importance of of telling lies and telling the truth and, and the places in which this matters. And this is something I think I want to spend a lot of time on next week on our overview episode is secrets and lies in this book and the secrets that people tell and and the lies that people tell and, and the way the times in which the book frames these lies as bad and destructive and the times in which these this book frames these lies as good and and for the benefit of our characters. Mm hmm. Sure. But that's that's a conversation for next week. Um, right now, Sleitman doesn't lie, though. He tells the truth. And so Roland spares him. But just because he won't kill him doesn't mean he like forgives him and doesn't mean he pities him. And this is, you know, going back to what we were talking about. I'm sorry. He said, sorry for what I've done. Balls to your sorry. Roland said, Ka works and the world moves on. So like this is it doesn't matter. Like like going back to the conversation between Roland and, and Callahan, like, do you want forgiveness? Do you want absolution? No, he doesn't because like, it's, what does it matter? Like mm-hmm. th- th- it's, this is caught. Like 
the good things I don't I I'm gonna hate I hate you for your choice I hate you for it and I will damn you for it but I don't care like you apologizing means nothing to me like forgiveness means nothing to me absolution means nothing to me because it doesn't matter Ka works and the world moves on bottom line he doesn't care yeah yeah I I, I like that that's um that's really interesting mm-hmm. so okay Matt Slightman finally gives us some more information about what the fuck is going on here. So we see that somewhere over there are poor, poor creatures called breakers. They're prisoners. Andy says that they're telepaths and psychokinetics. And although I can neither word, I know they're to do with the mind. The breakers are human and they eat what we eat to nourish their bodies, but they need other food, special food to nourish whatever it is that makes them special. Anyway, it's something only twins have, something that links them mind to mind. And these fellows, not the wolves, but they who sent the wolves, take it out. When it's gone, the kids are idiots. Root. It's food, Roland. Do you ken it? That's why they take them, to feed their goddamn breakers. Not their bellies or their bodies, but their minds. And I don't even know what, it's, what it is they've been set to break. The two beams that still hold the tower, Roland said. Oh, well, there, there it is, Matt. The bad guys are using prisoners to break the beams holding up the tower and feeding off the kids to supply energy to do so. And now there are only two beams left to hold up this all-important thing at the center of the universe. Seems bad. <laughs> nah, it's fine. I don't know, man. Uh, it's the sort of sort of satisfying explanation that like it makes sense, though I never would have guessed it because you know the story has hinted at the full constellation of all these ideas, but there's no way I could have drawn the lines and connected the dots. And, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Like it, it does make me wonder if we've met any other breakers either in this story or, or, you know, in, in other ones, like I wonder if the old guy in hearts in Atlantis is a breaker now. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I found this, I found this mo like, like moderately satisfying on the scale of, you know, answering big questions. So sure. So sure. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it it is cool. Um, it it answers a bunch of questions, forces you to ask a bunch more. I mean, the one interesting thing about it is we know this has been going on for like generations, right? That like it's been twenty three years since the last time, but we know th they came at least three times before that. So this has been a plan. This has been a, an effort in the making for a, a, a long time, a long time. Right. Right. Yeah, potentially hundreds of years. We don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, we we understand that now, and we'll see how that all plays out in the future. But we got to go back to this conversation now. And here, <laughs> here we go. I understand betrayal. I've done my share of it once to Jake himself, but that doesn't change what you are. Let's have that straight. You're a carrion bird, a rusty turned vulture. The color was back in Slightman's cheeks, turning them a shade of claret. I did what I did for my boy, he said stubbornly. Roland spat into his cupped hand, then raised the hand and caressed Slightman's cheek with it. The cheek was currently full of blood and hot to the touch. Then the gunslinger took hold of the spectacles Slightman wore and jiggled them slightly on the man's nose. Won't wash, he said very quietly, because of these. This is how they mark you, Slightman. This is your brand. You tell yourself you did it for your boy because it gets you to sleep at night. I tell myself what I did to Jake I did so as to not lose my chance at the tower. And that gets me to sleep at night. The difference between us, the only difference, is that I never took a pair of spectacles. He wiped his hands on his pants. You sold out, Slightman, and you have forgotten the face of your father. Boom. 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 And this is exactly what we were talking about, the duality of this book, right? The, the twins, again, we have Roland and Sleitman here. Roland is making, is defining Sleitman and him as the same, basically, except for one key difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not super eager to let Roland off the hook here. And, and I don't know if Roland is necessarily letting himself off the hook either. Um, I guess what, what Roland is saying is, hey, I may be an asshole, but I'm an asshole with integrity. And for Roland, I guess that counts quite a lot. I actually had a debate with myself, like, do I really care about this distinction? <laughs> like, like, do I really, like, if you're going to betray a, a child, does it really matter whether you took some spectacles in the deal or, or not? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. Yeah, I mean, it is an interesting thing 
to 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 get bent out of shape about right like mm-hmm. it is not the betrayal itself that roland chastises him for because like he's like yeah i've done that <laughs> it it is something it is something else it is it is the 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 benefits he got the the silver he got like you know if we're going back to biblical metaphors it's judas betrayed jesus not for the silver but because he felt like it was the right thing to do um but he got paid for it as well and and that like the the payment of the silver coins is what is what damned him is mm-hmm. what um is that he took a prize from what he mm. did um and, mm. and th- that is it's it's a fascinating distinction right because i think to go back to ka and, and to go back to destiny and to go back to god's plan like judas was necessary <laughs> for everything that happened with jesus right so like you could say that judas was just following ka or or whatever you want to call it and yet he's been damned for for what he did um the same thing with Slightman the same thing with Slightman that like, uh, once again, Ka like Ka works and the world moves on, but, but he took something else. He benefited from it in a way that is not just benefiting from it in a way to protect his, his kid. He benefited from it. He took a prize. He took more than one prize and he enjoyed those prizes. He enjoyed the life that those prizes let him live. And that is to Roland, like the, the line that has been crossed. Okay. Yeah. I like that a lot, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm having to process that, but that's really interesting. I like the the yeah. Judas comparison, especially. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm not entirely convinced. I'm, I'm totally uh, on, uh, like, correct here, but it, it feels, it feels good to me. Yeah, I'm sort of trying to, sort of trying to draw like thought experiments. Like, what if, what if Roland had, you know, gotten something more out of his interaction with the Man in Black? Like, I mean, he got the jawbone. Is that mm-hmm. is that a parallel to the eyeglasses? You could say uh, you could say no because he just wants that because he expects it to be useful to getting the tower. Um, he doesn't doesn't he's not going to enjoy having the jawbone. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm always I'm always suspicious and skeptical of Roland's attempts to to justify himself. Yeah, I mean, I think the important part of it to me is not that Roland says like. I'm the best and you suck. He actually says, we're the same. We've betrayed yeah. people. We're the same. Yeah. Like we both are miserable creatures, Yeah. but why are you damned? Why are, why are you, why have you forgotten the face of your father? Because you sold out. This is your brand. Sure. I like that. Um, yeah. And, and so, so this conversation ends and it's really wonderful. And, and I want to circle back to the conversation and to the Roland comparison when we finish uh, the story. But for now, we move on to the fight itself and we get this little tiny mini section here that says, at first, everything went according to plan and they called it Ka. When things began going wrong and the dying started, they called that Ka too. Ka, the gunslinger could have told them, was often the last thing you had to rise above. Um, and it's also the thing like that we've been told specifically you can't rise above, mm-hmm. right? Like everything is below Ka, we're told. So mm-hmm. I, I, I love that sentiment. Uh, like it, it, the thing about Ka is I think King knows that it's confusing the fuck out of you. And he's like, yep, that's the point, right? Because mm-hmm. like once again, we have a statement here. It's like when everything's going good, Ka. When everything's going bad, Ka. When everything's going normal, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I- I think I think viewing it as a paradox uh, paradoxically has straightened it out for me mm-hmm. because I, I've been trying to like decode it and be like, what is what does he mean? And, and if if what he means is, look, it's a it's a paradoxical concept. It's meant to be impenetrable and and, you know, basically yeah. map on to this free will versus determinism dichotomy thing. Then sure, I'm sure. like, oh, OK, I get it. I'm not supposed to it's not supposed to cleave cleanly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Uh, we we're gonna have a lot more to say about this before 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 uh these this story is up so i'll, cool. I'll save i have i have so many things i want to say right now but uh we'll get to that in time in time so roland sends the kids up the path towards the caves this is part of his whole fake out plan right and then he sends jake benny frank and francine uh a little bit further up and their plan is to draw the wolves up force them towards the cave and then come up from behind them but to do that they need to sell it make them make the wolves think that the kids are up there and that's that the the team of four's job is to throw around baubles and toys and stuff and and really sell to the wolves that the kids came up this way 
it's an interesting plan. Um, it's taking a lot on faith, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it does basically work, but it yeah, makes a it lot does. of assumptions, right? Uh, like, like Roland is clearly making a lot of a lot of assumptions about how how the wolves operate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speaking of the wolves, finally, hundreds and hundreds of pages later, Roland reveals what the wolves are. Not wolves, not zombies, but just robots. Robots with little spinning radar dishes atop their heads. They, they're gray horses, Matt, the thing that confused you so much. They're not horses at all. Just more machinery, more robots. So here it is. King's long, long, long held reveal is it been made pretty casually to us and and to the rest of the Kala. And now we have to ask the question here at the end, why? Why did King do it this way? Yeah, especially when it being robots is like, oh, but like everything has been robots the whole time. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about the radar dishes in particular here is very interesting because it, it does imply some kind of communication, right? Mm-hmm. Like they imply that these things are in some sense receiving orders from home base. Um, I mean, I don't know if they're all under the control of some greater mind like puppets or if there's just some greater entity giving them broad orders from time to time. But the fact that the wolves just kind of up and die as soon as their antennae are damaged uh, does hint at something like the former, like like they're being puppeted almost. Mm -hmm. Um, But as for like why why was this information hidden for so long? I don't know. I mean... (laughs) Maybe the secret, the big secret is is the idea of centralization, the idea of, you know, control and organization of the enemy. That, that was the secret. I don't know. Yeah, but like why? Like, I, I, honestly, I've been thinking about this since we finished the book. I mean, I've been thinking about this since we had the original conversations and and the ways in which our, our original idea that I loved so much was because it represented the fractured quartet. But this doesn't really line up with that perfectly because they're relatively like they're either still fractured or they're temporarily back together, you know, until, until Susanna goes, but it just doesn't line up perfectly here. I I just, I I don't, I don't have a satisfying answer for myself here. Like why, why this was held until this moment. Um, Why King kind of did cheated in a way that I really tend to not like, and that none of his characters just thought about, the wolves as robots for hundreds of pages until this one moment right before they came upon upon them mm-hmm. um I, I i just i don't i don't know i honestly though i thought you had guessed it like i thought you were that when you, when you focused in on the little part at the top of their head that was important like in the in the um ariza throwing i was like oh fuck he's gonna get it he's gonna get it and i was convinced you had just guessed it and then you didn't just connect that last dot. Uh-huh. I was like, oh, he was so close. <laughs> <sighs> Sigh. So disappointed in myself. <laughs> yeah. Good, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't, I can't actually remember if this was like something that occurred to me and then I just kind of skipped off of it. I mean, I must have at some point thought maybe they're robots. Cause I think, it, I think I thought, I think I just went through at some point and I was like, maybe they're vampires, maybe they're robots, maybe they're zombies, maybe they're <laughs> mm-hmm. werewolves, maybe they're, uh, uh, yeah. So, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, may, maybe King just likes to every once in a while have a thing that he holds back and, and reveals to you. And it's, it's just like, I'm not, I'm not trying to like, say the say that he made a mistake here it's just like when 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 the reveal came i was just like oh you know i wasn't like oh my god right, right? like it's right. like oh this, uh, oh okay more robots in this in this series that has had a lot of bad robots in it mm-hmm. yeah it's not it's not an impactful reveal mm-hmm. like that's the weird thing about it is because every single one of our characters the characters that we are primarily in the point of view of already know it's not an emotional impactful moment for any of them because they already know. So it's an emotional impactful moment for like Cy Eisenhart, who is like, what? Yeah. And then, and and then that's it. Right. Like it, it, it doesn't matter that, I mean, that's the honest truth is it just doesn't matter that they're robots. Like it doesn't matter to the plot of the book. It doesn't, yeah. I guess the only the only way it matters is that we know that 
they have bosses, right? Mm-hmm. That they, they yeah. are being controlled. But exactly. even that we were told by Sleipman before the reveal that they're robots. Mm-hmm. So I, I, yeah, I don't know. It, it is I, those listening at home. Do you have, do you have any guesses as to why this was held for so long and, and revealed in such an undramatic way? I don't know. Like, I don't want to just call it bad because I don't think yeah. it's bad. I love the sequence. I really love it, but I don't have a good answer either. Yeah. It's not like it, it's not like it negatively impacted my enjoyment of the sequence. I was just like, Oh, and then I went on. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Matt, let's do it. Okay. The kids go off to hide in the rice and Roland and the rest of the gunslingers and Ariza throwers get down in the bunkers. They've dug at the side of the road, but something's wrong. Jake and the others aren't back yet and they should be, but Ka had other plans. One of the twins with Jake was running and got his foot stuck in a hole and his leg snapped. They can't get out and the wolves are coming. Yeah, this uh, th- this sucked. The, the graphic description of the, of the leg breaking was terrible. Oof. Yeah, yeah. And and I love how Jake looks at it and says, trouble, Jake thought, and in our road, which is like perfectly, perfectly summoning Roland here, yeah. right? Like yeah. that's, I, I think that's a direct Roland quote yeah. from early in the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it was from his, his, his backstory, his, his, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I think that's what, I think that's how he referred to the, the, green palace as well mm-hmm. um, yeah i think you're right yeah 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 you're right Ugh. so time is ticking down as king frantically flits between jake's point of view as they struggle to get frank's foot out of the hole it's stuck in and the rest of the content as they watch the wolves get closer and closer time enough to get back maybe but it's running close i i love i love the tension here i absolutely love it um as like we're going back and forth and like the, the wolves the wolves are moving faster than they thought possible and oh my god it's so tense are they going to get back in time and we don't know like, like, i think like all bets are off at this point jake could have died in this moment yeah we don't know for sure i, I do love this point as well um they're trying to get frank poor frank tavery out and he says my ankle burning shut up jake said benny laughed it was shock laughter but it was also real laughter Jake looked at him around the sobbing, bleeding Frank Tavery and winked. Benny winked back. And just like that, they were friends again. Fuck you, Steve. <laughs> Fuck you. It sucks, but it's good still, right? Like, at least they were friends. At least Benny goes out a hero. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, he goes out a hero. Like, he, he does. He is a key to helping this kid out here, right? He saves yeah. Frank Tavery's He's, life. He here. saves this kid. He he get, He saves... He saves a life, which is more than I think most people in the Kala could could say about themselves yeah. at the end yeah. of all this. Yeah. Uh, j- j- in case things weren't tense enough, we briefly cut back over to Susanna, who's once again attacked by the cramps. And this is the moment that we were talking about before um, where she she pleads with Mia to give her a little bit more time. Um, and we see here at the same instant, the image of a great banquet hall filled her mind, steaming roast, stuffed fish, smoking steaks, magnums of champagne, frigates filled with gravy, rivers of red wine. She heard a piano and a singing voice. That voice was charged with an awful sadness. Someone saved, someone saved, someone saved my life tonight. It sang. Uh, God, that's so ominous. Like, not yeah. only does she see the 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 castle she's been visiting but now the song the song yeah. that was from callahan's story is playing right. here well it's it is really it seems bad because it's like there's there's bleed over there's there's mm-hmm. breaking down of, of the boundaries because you know it's like at worst before there would be like a blackout or there, there'd be a uh, there'd be lost time and yeah. then she would kind of wave it away and excuse it away and this has become so intrusive that now it's it's like wrenching away control of her very thoughts in in the moment she doesn't even yeah she doesn't even black out she's actually seeing what mia sees yeah yeah and like we said before she doesn't pray to god this time she negotiates directly with the mother of the chap if mia lets Susanna finish this she will help her with the baby she will help make sure the baby comes out and comes out healthy mia agrees what i love about this is it fills us with impending dread like this battle actually when we when we break down the fight it's not very dramatic. Like there, I, I think there's no point once Roland stands up and and shouts and and they all charge. They basically just win, right? Like they just like there's no moment where it looks like our quartet might lose the fight. Um, and there's, so there's not a lot of drama of okay, are they going to lose? But there is drama behind it. There's tension behind it because we know this has happened. Now we know King has just 
put a bomb under our our battle and now we're just waiting even even if we can say oh whew, they made it we know this is here still yeah and i think i was i was maybe even expecting you know the battle to be turned in a bad direction by something that mia herself did during the battle oh interesting um, which yeah. also you know also didn't happen obviously but but it's just yet another little kind of variable in play that's just making you a bit a bit worried a bit uh, uh it, making it credible that something could go very badly wrong sure sure yeah it also creates you know there there's this terrible like power that's coming from M- mia and or the chap i guess you know m- maybe it's coming from the chap um but it like it seems like susanna has no real resistance to it. She can only really compromise and it's not even like a winning compromise. She's, she's almost losing mm-hmm. everything except, you know, the, the barest win she can eke out here is like, look, just let us defeat the wolves. And then you can basically have everything you want. And yeah, it yeah. makes, it makes, it makes Mia out to be kind of this overpowering force. Yeah. Like, like we talked about earlier, the, the God of, of Susanna's existence yeah, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's this moment I really wanted to highlight here because R- Roland spurred on once again by the, the voice of, of court, not Vinay. He's gone away. No more politicking. It's time for gunslinging now. Uh, he's spurred on by that voice and calls the four kids over just in time to get them all safely into the bunker. And I love this part. Down, down, down. He landed beside her and Jake landed on top of him. Roland could feel the boys madly beating heart between his shoulder blades through both of their shirts and had a moment to relish that sensation. I absolutely adore that in the midst of this battle, King takes a brief moment for Roland to feel the heartbeat, the living beat of his son, basically, and and relish in it and relish in he's here. He's safe. I didn't lose him. Um, mm-hmm. It's just it's just really wonderful. Yeah. Even at his most gunslingery, he is a loving human being. And he is. Yeah. That's I think that's the core of this whole story, really. Then Roland's eye of imagination and intuition open once more and wider than ever. He sees the entire battlefield, the kids hiding in the rice. He sees the wolves, their formations, where they will be and how many in each pack. He sees everything. And it's once again, this long paragraph of this beautifully descriptive and frankly, poetic writing that I just, I just can't get enough of Matt. And I'm not going to read any of it because we're going long, but it's beautiful yeah i love the descriptive writing there's Mm -hmm. there's this fun ambiguity between what truly is just an intuition based on years of combat experience Mm -hmm. uh versus like a psychic astral projection shit that could very well happen (laughs) in this story and the thing is it doesn't matter it's badass either way we sort of created a character who maybe both of those things are almost the same for him and that's awesome yeah well the way king describes it is it's not like it's not just his intuition. It's like he 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 almost personifies it or, or makes it physical. His eye of intuition opens up like he is summoning this power inside himself, this power of imagination and intuition to completely accurately like plot out the battle before he's even seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And it, so, it, yeah, it could it could be magic, but it could not be. Yeah. 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 So Roland counts to 19 and then begins the attack. As always, he was never so happy to be alive as he was when he prepared to deal death. Five minutes worth of blood and stupidity, he told them, and here those five minutes were. He'd also told them he'd feel he always felt sick afterward. And while that was true enough, he never felt so fine as he did at this moment of beginning. Never felt so completely and truly himself. And that is, I mean, that is a core truth of of roland to shane right as much as like he's a loving person he's a person that struggles um struggles with making the right decision he's a person that's a a prisoner to ka he is a warrior he is a gunslinger and he is a death dealer and this is what he this is what he does this is what he is for and we we sometimes forget that because the book goes so long between moments like this but every time it comes king reminds us of it Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, very, very true. Um, and maybe a, a, an element of his character we haven't discussed too much. Maybe, maybe this is something we should circle back around to in our wrap up for the whole book. Sure, sure. So the battle is going well until Margaret Eisenhart's head gets chopped off by a lightsaber and Benny in fear sprints out of the ditch and into the open road where he's immediately targeted and exploded by a sneech. 
Ugh, let's uh, let's talk about Benny's death a little bit here. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's good to talk about both deaths and maybe compare them because sure. you know they're both worth talking about. So Margaret Eisenhart, it's a very interesting character, right? She's the woman mm-hmm. who left the Manny. She's the woman who was the first to show Roland the hidden strength of the Ariza by demonstrating her own skill. She's the woman who convinced her husband that they needed to stand strong because she said, hey, we didn't lose any children, but we also lost all of our children because they all left to, Mm -hmm. to, you know, they all fled the wolves when they were old enough. Um, So in some sense, she has, she has bought into this as an adult. She made her own decisions as an adult. She put her life on the line um, fully consciously, you know, sort of making every, every choice in, in the sequence of choices leading to this. And in contrast, Benny just, uh, he's just an innocent, he's just a complete and utter innocent kid, had no idea mm-hmm. what he was really getting into, um, died for his father's sins, you could argue. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know if I even like that, because what does that mean? <laughs> well, I mean, here's, here's the interesting part about it, is the comparison to Roland. Mm-hmm. Because the thing about Roland is, he makes choices and everyone else around him dies, right? That is what happens to Roland again and again and again. He continues to live. Everyone else dies. And and once again, we make the comparison between Ben Sleitman and Roland. Ben Sleitman made, made a choice and he lives. The It's the people in his life that he loves that suffer for his choices. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that like that again shows how they are the same, how they are similar, how they are two sides of the same coin in that he he is damned to live is Ben Sleitman. He now has to live knowing that he betrayed this town. And it's almost worse that they don't find out about it, that that he'll be able to exist possibly um, without them ever knowing what he did. Yeah. And he has to go on knowing that his kid is dead. The, and, and it's and it's not his fault, obviously. Like he his choice did not lead to Benny's death, but it's like he the uh, Ka is making Benny suffer for for the the betrayal of his dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really did sit with this idea for a while that his dad was going to live and just continue on in the town because I was like, well, is there any possible path of redemption or, or absolution for this character if, if he he's going to stay in the town? I mean, maybe he could, in some in some way, work you know work off his debt by you know just be being great you know just really really taking care of everyone as well as he possibly can. And and I was like, I don't know, that's a big debt to try to work off. And I that that that, that definitely knocked around in my head for for a, a little while while I was thinking about the way the story ended yeah yeah i mean especially like the moments where ben Sleitman almost blows it because he sees the kid and like immediately blames roland like mm-hmm. you did this you killed him you you did this to punish me and of course roland did nothing of the sort mm-hmm. um and, yeah. and and ben like in maybe the one good choice he makes here is like recognizes that and calms down um and just allows it just mourns his son yeah yeah um, but the battle's not over yet. And Jake like shrieks Benny's name and then goes just like walking towards the remaining wolves. Eddie joins him and is like, hey, want a partner? And then hands over the the, uh, the sneeches and we see Harry Potter, Harry Potter model written on them in case we had any doubts about where these come from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh-huh. Yep. Mm-hmm. Who who's Harry Potter? I don't know. He's probably the one that made these. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a weapons yeah, manufacturer. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jake though, like totally ignores them. Like he just drops them on the ground and and continues to deal in lead as he charges up against the last group of wolves. And there's this this wonderful moment where the rest of the quartet like stands with him. Like they just go and stand with him, and like Jake allows some of them to live a little bit longer to give Eddie and Roland. A, sh- a shot at killing some and then jake gives like the last one alive he allows Susanna to take it out and it's this wonderful moment of like silent teamwork as they just take down the rest of them and and just like that it's over yeah it's over. it i mean just just to briefly talk about the combat and, and how it how it goes like as we're building up toward this we're terrified because it's like okay they got lightsabers they got 
they got body seeking explosive bombs and in the end it's like okay well they never get they almost they basically never get close enough to use the lightsabers mm-hmm. turns out that you can shoot the lightsabers out so they're not really lightsabers you can also shoot the sneeches out of the air because you're fucking gunslingers mm-hmm. um and so the gunslingers with their handguns just completely dominate these wolves with their terrifying sci-fi weapons yep and and it it works perfectly in the moment but it is funny to reflect on how like as this moment was coming you were like man how are they going to deal with these wolves when all they have are guns and it's like well guns are actually pretty good (laughs) um yeah well and i think the strategy they caught them so flat-footed and unaware it's like mm -hmm. the these things had gotten complacent and and overconfident a little bit i mean it's the same in the same way that they caught andy an incredibly quick and powerful robot flat-footed they caught the wolves and they were able to to take them out before they were able to do yeah too much against them well there's a moment here toward the end where um i don't i don't know if the book quite goes where i thought it was going to go or maybe i'm misremembering but it's like the people are looking over you know all the dead wolves and there's almost a sense of like could we have done this at any time if we decided to like, <laughs> yeah. was it really this easy to stand up to them and wipe them out? And now we're free. And how many yeah. generations of this did we put up with that? We didn't actually have to. Yeah. Now, yes, they have gunslingers with them, but that's not really that much firepower. Ultimately it, it, was, it was mostly the plan you could say. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's almost, you know, textual because like, the, in the aftermath they're asking them well what if they come back what do we do if they come back and roland's just like well you know how to kill them now mm-hmm. so yeah y- you've got your plates fine. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you, um yeah yeah so i mean it is it is rather interesting that that so much of the success of the wolves in the end was just the fear that they created and that's why i mean most of most of this seems to be a, a collection of pop culture references meant to to convey power mm-hmm. and and that that n- is not necessarily all there um that is just that they were just like willing these people into complacency through fear mm-hmm. yeah exactly and then we get this moment for a moment tian's wife only stood there processing this information then she did something that surprised a man who was not often surprised. She threw herself against him, pressing her body frankly to his, and covered his face with hungry, wet-lipped kisses. Roland bore this for a little bit, then held her away. The sickness was coming now, the feeling of uselessness, the sense that he would fight this battle or battles like it over and over for eternity, losing a finger to the lobstrosities here, perhaps an eye to a clever old witch there. And after each battle, he would sense the dark tower a little farther away instead of a little closer. And all the time, the dry twist would work its way towards his heart. Stop that, he told himself. It's nonsense. And you know it. Ah, he's gonna lose an eye at some point huh <laughs> that's what you took from this <laughs> uh you know i mean it's 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 uh it's hard right it's it's yet more i think you know we talked earlier today even about he's just not he, he he's not he never gives himself credit for anything he didn't give himself a mm-hmm. moment a moment of satisfaction about having won this fight it's if anything it's like he feels worse than he did before and yeah uh, yeah well it, yeah. it's interesting how like the argument he made to to them to the rest of the content earlier in the book was we have to do this because this is gunslinger work and if we don't do this we won't be gunslingers anymore and we'll never get to the tower like that that was his argument and now here at the end of that work all he feels is that he's further away from the tower and, and that, that this is just going to keep happening. I'm just going to keep killing people. And every time I kill people, every time I fight like this, I'm a little bit further away and, and my time is slowly ticking out and it's never going to happen. And I just feel useless and I feel it, like, like I'm just treading water and nothing matters. Um, mm-hmm. And, and stop that. He told himself it's nonsense and you know, it is it nonsense though. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'd like this connection between, you know, every, every battle he fights actually puts him farther away from the tower. If, if mm-hmm. um, I don't know, I don't know if that's literally true, but uh, I, I, I get it. I yeah, like it. I get it too. It, it's, it's so he, like 
we we are mean to him at times, but. I also really feel for him. I really feel for him that he can't even be happy in this moment, that that this woman who is just so happy that he has he has come into this town and saved them all, saved their children, saved all the future generations from now on. And all he feels is discomfort. All he feels is at her graciousness. He bore it for a little bit, then held her away. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. It's so sad. So in the aftermath of the battle, Jake puts a horse that broke its legs out of its misery and then sits there casually looking at the exploded corpse of his death, his best dead best friend. He then asks Roland to roll him a smoke because he's not a boy any longer. And yet, Matt, Jake doesn't actually inhale. So what? What? there's a lot of imagery going on here. And what does all this mean? I don't know. I kind of see it as a sign of maturity, but in a weird it's, it's kind of weirdly difficult to say why, like. Like, like he doesn't want to destroy himself, which is what maybe he sees smoking as, but also he, he, he kind of wants the symbol, like the token of manhood. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I said. Like it's, it's, it's a token of manhood, but not all the way yet. Right. Like, it's like, it's like when you were a kid and you smoked those candy cigarettes, Right. right. Where you wanted to look like a cool adult. Right. But you're not actually smoking. He's not actually smoking here. Yeah. He's just, he's just draping himself in in right. the adult clothing the, the kind of kid that i was if somebody had offered me a cigarette i would have i would have maybe pretended to smoke it but like i i i was i was too good of a kid you know what i mean um mm-hmm. but i might have held it to try to look cool so yeah, yeah yeah but i mean but at the same time i do think like this this little beat of him you know taking out the horse because the horse has been suffering um I thought that was wonderful because yeah. that is, that is another very mature, very like emotional thing. You have to shoot an animal in the head and he just does it. He just doesn't even think about it. He just does it. He recognizes that it has to be done and he does it. Yeah. I honest, I mean, kind of worried about our boy Jake here. Like he seems a bit traumatized, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> a little, little bit traumatized here. Like, like it's cool to recognize the maturity of it, but also like, I, I don't know, man. Well, that's 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 why I, I I'm harping on it so much because uh-huh. it, it, there there is maturity here, but it's it's the illusion of maturity. It's the illusion of adulthood. It's well, it's a boy. It's a boy that's not. He's not an adult yet, right? Like he's 13 maybe, and he's doing things that he shouldn't have to do, <laughs> right? And he's he's picking up this token, this symbol of manhood, of adulthood, and the cigarette, and just like this gun, and he's wielding it and he's smoking it but it's not real yeah i mean i almost saw it more as like he's sort of dissociating here mm-hmm. and doing borderline crazy out of character things like yeah like shooting a horse in the head it's just not a very jake-like thing to do he's he's a very sensitive and kind i mean and, it, it, and it's a it, it's a compassionate thing to do in a certain sense but also it's really sort of cold-blooded um yeah 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 i don't know i i've we we end the book so soon after this that i'm just i'm i'm like okay well i really want to see where where jake is mentally you know as the next book starts yeah uh i think we'll circle back around to him briefly in the the epilogue as well Mm -hmm, i have something mm -hmm. i want to say but um so Sleitman shows up and, as we said before, blames Roland for killing Benny, but Jake sets him straight. It's a, a devastating scene, a scene of a man reaping what he was sowed but living. The best thing Ben Sleitman could have done for his son was die a hero, Roland said. Instead, Benny has to die a hero for him while he goes on. Very much like Roland Deshane. Very much so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Everybody's reactions to to the deaths that, that did occur are just so harrowing and, and as yeah, usual, very, yeah. very realistic. Um, I wanted to draw attention again, again to Jake here actually, where Jake's responding to Slightman and he says, did you even look at him? He asked Benny's da. No bullet ever made could do that. Cy Eisenhart, that, sorry, uh, Cy Eisenhart's head almost fell. God, I, I messed up my color here. Let me fix my color <laughs> and then I will. And then I'll be able to read it. Sorry. You can't read it in the wrong color? Yeah. Did you even look at him? He asked Benny's da. No bullet ever made could do that. Cy Eisenhart's head fell almost on top of him, and Benny crawled out of the ditch from the the horror of it. 
It was a word, he realized, that he had never used out loud. He never needed to use it out loud. Um, I don't know, that really, that that line in particular really sh- struck me as, as, um, as Jake is reeling from this, you know, sort of, yeah. sort of in, in real time, still recovering from the trauma. And he, he's almost being cold as he's talking to Sleitman. He's, he's just being very like matter of fact about things when clearly he's, he's kind of stunned and he's using the, you know, using the word horror. It's, it's like, it, it you know, reminds me of, uh, 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 apocalypse now um you know the the horror of ever, the, the the horror it's uh it's 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 too much right it's too much to encompass with words and and um yeah he uses this word he's never used before because he has no other way of conceptualizing it yeah i love that i'm glad you pulled that out it, it is really powerful um and yeah it, like it's interesting because he's both cold and in shock in some places and then weeping openly and others like yeah he's not doing well that's the important thing he's not doing well yeah yeah so eddie and jake talk about the wolves because well there's some weird shit <laughs> You were right about the Harry Potter snitches and the Star Wars lightsaber mat, but not the Lord of the Rings cloaks. Actually, they were Marvel Comics cloaks because the wolves of the Kala are dressed like Dr. Doom. Uh huh. What the fuck is going on, Matt? Yeah, I don't I'm not going to be too hard on myself for that because Dr. Doom is not like somebody I know much about or yeah. or whatever. I don't know. I mean, for for whatever reason, they dress up the robots to be having pop culture icons from a, a relatively narrow sp- space of, of time um mm-hmm. in the late 20th century don't know man it's weird <laughs> I, I, like, it is weird like uh, like I, I mean the the honestly the weirdest thing to me is like no no it's not just it it's the it is a harry potter snitch it's a literal harry potter snitch but it's a bomb that kills people uh huh. Which has nothing to do with the snitches in Harry Potter. Nope. And I mean, at least a lightsaber is a weapon for killing people, but a snitch is a is a is a toy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, a, it's not a it's not a heat seeking missile. It's so a, that's why they changed the name to Snitches. I guess, but it's the Harry Potter model, though. Yes. It's so are weird. there other models? I maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the Hermione Granger model. Oh my god! I don't know. Man. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it, it's wonderful, and I mean, it, it's one of those things that you're just like, you just all, all you have are questions. That's all you have. Um, but it's it's such a cool like when I thought of this book before we reread it again, that's the thing I remembered because it's just this astronomically insane idea that like okay the big bad of this book is going to be these robots dressed as wolves but they're not just dressed as wolves they're dressed as dr doom with wolf masks on also they're carrying a lightsaber and most absurd of all they are throwing toys from the harry potter sport that explode and slice your body up it's it's just absurd it's just absurd in the most wonderful way yeah yeah, I I almost wonder if we're ever going to really have an explanation, you know, like, are we just going to move on? We're just going <laughs> to move on. We're never going to talk about this again. We might. We yeah, might. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. But unfortunately, Matt, in all the distraction and celebration, nobody has noticed that Susanna isn't around anymore until they do. And by that time, Roland knows it's already too late. Yeah. Yeah, her transition and and gradual fading out of the scene was something that I noticed happening in the background. You know, yeah, with, yeah, with with the mounting dread. Yeah, um, King um King puts her there, like he has the scene where we see clearly that Mia has taken over, which is wonderful, mm-hmm. and then he like puts her there in the background of other points of view, and it's like, and then Susanna was out there doing whatever. Yeah, like, yeah. and it's just like it's 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 perfect because she's just there enough where you know that's Mia and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then like you kind of get distracted too because like there's a lot of interesting conversations happening and like the Cala folk are like singing and and marching out and it's like this wonderful, happy scene. But there she goes. She's gone. Yeah, you're nervous because you're like, is somebody going to notice? Is is she going to create a a problem? Um, I like, you know, uh, one of the things when when Jake asked for the cigarette, uh, Roland looks to her for kind of approval and she mm-hmm. you know and, and and mia is like 
uh sure you know like, like and, yeah. I, and i almost feel like i don't know if susanna would have given the pass on that you know maybe susanna would have maybe not maybe she would have been like no come on you know you don't yeah. you don't need that jake you know mm-hmm. maybe that's maybe that's what jake needed in that moment for somebody to be like you don't need a cigarette jake <laughs> yeah maybe I don't, know. I don't know i don't know all right matt that is the end of the book and now we are on to the epilogue called the doorway cave and our epilogue begins with the Katet chasing Mia down, down uh, the Arroyo. Um, everyone else seems to be catching up on whatever. Everyone is like, this is the, this is the interesting thing about this opening, Matt. Everyone else is still trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. Mm-hmm. Who is it? Is Mia like, where is she going? What could she be doing? But Roland is like ahead of them all. Like Roland knows what Mia is going to do. She knows where she's going. He knows he's figured it all out already and he's limping again yeah and it's just this wonderful moment of realization where he's i i really think the limping ties to the secret key thing to me like this is this is a big secret that he's kept and and susanna choosing to keep this secret about mia's encroaching problem has screwed them over as well Mm -hmm. um and and so it's all these things kind of coming together at the end here. Yeah, so I guess you could say the consequence of of all the secret keeping and and sort of the breaking of the tet, it wasn't that the the wolves defeat them. It was that Susanna leaves and is gone. Yep, and that that's the and, cost. And this is the point where I remind you what the man in black said to Callahan that I will give you the tool of their destruction, mm-hmm. right? And we thought maybe that that had something to do with the wolves had something to do with this thing. But now at the end of the book, the tool of their destruction is black 13 and who has taken it Mia and has gone from their reach. So I think in the back of your head, you have to wonder, is that what was meant by this? Like it seemed like Callahan brought them this thing and solved all their problems for them. But now actually um, now Mia is gone and, and what is going to come out of Mia and, yeah. and what is going to happen? Right. Yeah. Maybe giving them even worse problems than they've ever had before. Yep. 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 Uh, I, I love I love this moment as well. This is the Jake part I wanted to talk to you about. Come on, he said. I don't care who she is, Roland. If four able bodied men can't catch one no legs lady, we ought to turn in our guns and call it a day. Jake smiled wanly. I'm touched. You just called me a man. Don't let it get to your head, sunshine. Come on. So like <laughs> Jake's pretty fucked up, right? Like mm-hmm. I, this is I, King is like weaving the themes of this book together here in the epilogue in such wonderful ways. And like the, the, the theme of Jake going from boyhood to manhood has been present throughout this entire story. And here in the epilogue, you just called me a man. I'm touched. Um, and that's the thing he's focusing on here mm-hmm. because he, I think he wants desperately not to be that boy anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, he want like, if he's going to have to keep doing these things and make these choices, better to be a man than a boy and Mm -hmm. so that's the part he focuses on and here in this this panicked moment where they've lost a member of their quartet and they're chasing after her that's what he focuses on yeah yeah i like that i also noticed i I feel like sunshine is the sort of word that susanna would have used so Mm -hmm. it's like a uh the The other character referencing her you know in a way yeah and so they find little signs of mia the wheelchair and the ring that eddie made her which is like heartbreaking because like that's a symbol of their love being cast aside. Um, like th- these are the things that made her Susanna. Right. And, and, and she's throwing them away as she goes up this, this path towards the store. And we learn that someone has left Mia like a sort of motorized tricycle. And I want to talk about that for a bit because we're, we're, we speculate that maybe Andy might have set this up for her or, or someone else. We're not really sure either way. Like, our heroes were making their plans toward victory and it was victory with the wolves. And the whole time it seems their enemies were playing a different game. And that game was to get Mia, to get Susanna, to get this chap, whatever it is. And they have absolutely won at that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there were a lot of things that were left here in these canyons by somebody, you know, maybe Andy, but no real reason to assume that. I think you could just as well assume that, this you know four wheeler or whatever it was had been left by the man in black you know a hundred thousand years sure. ago or whatever because sure cause apparently that's how long this game has been in play um, 
So they get to the cave and the voices are for the first time really getting to our characters. We see Rhea is here again and Henry and all these voices are really fucking Eddie over. He is not in a good spot. And and these voices that they've been able to kind of ignore and, and shrug off are now really getting to them. Yeah, yeah. And and Eddie's in a particularly bad emotional state, too. So so yeah, o- yeah. O- overall... I mean, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. It, it's the epilogue, but it's a very intense epilogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like the thing I like about it is Callahan is able to silence the voices by calling upon God, right? Like this is this, this former priest that was rejected by God, he said. Um, and by, at the end of this book, at the end of his, his story in this novel, like he seems to have been fully embraced again because through the power of God, he silences these evil voices. No, I like that. Um, yeah. Good point. Pr- pretty important like i said this the thing i love about this epilogue is everything that king has it's pretty short and we're going through it pretty quickly because this is a very long episode but everything that he's doing in and has been doing in the story is coming together very neatly in this epilogue mm-hmm. yeah for sure yeah so roland picks up the book that he knew was as important as the rose and boldly states that he knows exactly how to open the door but he's not sure where they want to go after susanna of course or or do they? What about Calvin Tower? What about the, the vacant lot? Aren't those those things more important than one member of the quartet? He asks, and Eddie does not take that well at all. <laughs> yeah. But that's, I mean, those are the choices Roland has made and, and always made. And now here, here it is again, right? Here is another choice, another wh- who will you go after? What will you do? Um, and we'll see, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, hey, Matt, mm-hmm. speaking of that book, Salem's Lot, he read, a novel by Stephen King. He looked up at Eddie, then at Jake. Heard of him? <laughs> oh, man. So so close to having all of this sorted out if he had just talked about it earlier. <laughs> also, it's funny because Eddie, doesn't Eddie talk about having seen The Shining? Uh, yeah. yeah. So he definitely should have heard of Stephen King. Like, uh, like, yeah. Unless it was... <laughs> Richard Bachman's The Shining or or whatever whatever bullshit. <laughs> I That's don't know. a a good question Matt that um well, I don't have an answer. Okay, for okay. Well, that's that's fine. Um, but yes, it is interesting that that Eddie Dean knows what The Shining is but does not know who Stephen King is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but like Callahan is freaking out, right? Yeah, yeah. Like he he's just learned his life is in a book and things he's never said out loud things he's never told anyone before are in this novel about his life this this novel that exists in our world as well yeah that, and he just kind of continues to have this freak out in the background for the whole rest of the epilogue yeah i mean i, I am not a character yeah. <laughs> i am i am real i am a person and this is like we've always done in these books we've always done this referential thing we've been re- referencing other stephen king books we've been referencing the stephen king universe but we've never done it in this way this is not um a character came from salem's lot and now he's in this story this is a character has is made aware that his life is a, a book that's fucking crazy yeah yeah we're going a whole nother direction now. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about it? Like, like what are you excited? Is this, does this interesting to you? Or are you kind of like a lot of people were very turned off by this choice to, to make it this kind of meta. I I mean, I, I think I felt like we were going in this direction for a long time. So okay. um, I have whatever I I've, I'm just, I've had plenty of time to decide that I'm going to be open to whatever interesting things King is doing here. And it's been clear forever that this was going to be a very meta story. Mm. So, um, you know, in a very referential intertextual story. So sure. And, and, and I've been, I've enjoyed all of the other stuff that he's done with those concepts so far. So I'm just like, all right, well, I, I have faith. He's going to continue to do fun and interesting things with those concepts. But did you think that a character would say, I am not a character in a novel. <laughs> uh, it doesn't surprise me that much, really. Like, <laughs> like, like, like it was several books ago that people first started making references where I was like, we're going to, somebody's going to find a copy of the dark tower at some point, aren't they? You know, um, that's fun. Yeah. 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 I mean, you were convinced that this was wolves of the Cala, this book. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, I was so close, so close you to were. it. I, I said it was the dark tower. I said it was wolves of the Cala. The, the one, the one book reference in this book that I didn't 
I didn't suggest was uh, yeah. I, 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 I it was another one of those instances like the wolves being robots thing that I thought you were about to make the correct guess and I was about to be shocked and then you just got so close but you didn't quite get there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe the next the next time the next time we do this podcast, you know. But you were close enough for government work, right? That's how I feel. So, just mark that one correct, and we that's move a, on. That's just that's one of those Stephen King isms that I love that I had never heard before. I read maybe it's like an older people say that I don't know. Like I've never seen the phrase "close enough for government work" anywhere else but Stephen King books, and he uses it all the time. I think he uses it in this epilogue. <laughs> That's interesting. I feel like I've heard it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an expression. Yeah. I, like, but I just never, I've never seen it mm-hmm. elsewhere. Mm-hmm. He loves it. He loves it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. So it's time to end this book. And here's how we end it, Matt. Roland. It was Eddie. The gunslinger turned to him. I need to find her. I don't care who's real and who's not. I don't care about Calvin Tower, Stephen King, or the Pope of Rome. As far as reality goes, she's all of it. I want. I need to find my wife. His voice dropped. Help me, Roland. Roland reached out and took the book in his left hand. With his right hand, he touched the door. If she's still alive, he thought, if we can find her, and if she's coming back to herself, if and if and if. Eddie took Roland's arm. Please, he said, please don't make me try to do it on my own. I love her so much. Help me find her. Roland smiled. It made him younger. It seemed to fill the cave with its own light. All of Eld's ancient power was in that smile, the power of the white. Yes, he said, we go. And then he said it again, all the affirmation necessary in this dark place. Yes. So it seems like Roland is making a different choice here, right? Mm -hmm. Like he's like, we got to go after tower. We got to go after the, 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 the dark tower. the, The, the vacant lot is more important than your wife, Eddie. He says, But then here at the very end of the book, Eddie begs him, begs him. And he says, yes, yes, Mm -hmm. we will go. We will go get Susanna. Um, Yeah. And it's, he he, seems to, at least he seems to. And it's, you know, yes is the same. It's, 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 it's what the, it's what the rose says, right? The, the, the affirmation and the goodness of the rose that says, that says yes. Yeah. Um, And, and and, and that decision, that decision is accentuated by this light this power the white like roland has never like lit up like this way like he's he's smiled and i'm putting that in quotes a lot but like this is it made him younger it filled the cave with its own light like back to doing the right thing making the right choice right and how that the power in that how that how that changes you and i think we're seeing that here i I feel like this may be literally the first time in this book that Roland has smiled in, in this particular <laughs> book. Like, like his every other smile in Wolves of the Kala has been a smile of manipulation of some kind or mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not even, not even joking about that. Like, I, I think this is what we've seen him smile in other books. We've seen him have happy, happy moments of relief in other books, but this is, yeah, this, this smile very, very last, very last page of the book. So I think the only time he's been yeah. genuinely, genuinely felt like something was good. Yeah. And I mean, like, importantly, that quote from the very beginning of the book that Roland says, first come smiles, then come lies. Last is gunfire. Mm. Right. And then we finish this book and we're back to smiles. Right. Like the, the gunfire is over and we're back to smiles and he mm. smiles here and there's power in that smile, mm. that genuine smile. Yeah, but I feel like this time it's a different kind of smile than the the smiles of the Kala. So. Oh yeah, certainly, yeah. certainly. So that is Wolves of the Kala. That's it. We did it. All right. Uh, this this extra super length episode. <laughs> yep. We are two hours and twenty minutes into this thing, and we haven't even done the discussion question yet. So uh, why don't we just get right into that? Yeah. All right, Matt, the question from last week was favorite malevolent AI slash robot characters. And we got a bunch of answers to this one. And I think they're all really fun. We're going to go through them very quickly, though, folks. We're going to try to do this in, in 10 minutes and finish by by two minutes, two hours and yes, 30 minutes. It is very late. 
Uh, yes. Drugs Possum says, my favorite AI character in fiction will forever be Ultron from Marvel Comics, especially as he is portrayed by James Spader in the second Avengers movie. I've always imagined Blaine the Mono as having the same snarky, self-assured, and somehow terrifying metallic voice. Yes, uh, in, absolutely invaluable part of the MCU. Yeah, uh, a lot of people don't like Age of Ultron. I like it. Yeah. Uh, there's there's parts of it that don't work as well. It's a good movie. Yeah. Uh, Mojo Yashka says, uh, my initial response would be GLaDOS because she's the most fun and she has a great theme song. Uh, that's a character from uh, Portal, Matt, a game that you refuse to play. I've played Portal 1. <laughs> Have you? I've played Portal so 1. So you know who GLaDOS is? Who GLaDOS okay. is. All right, fine. However, for the purposes of being current, I want to go with Mother from the HBO Max series Raised by Wolves. I'm still one episode from the end, but Mother is a fascinating AI character. Without getting too spoiler, she's a weapon, spoilery, she's a weapon of destruction that's been reprogrammed to take care of the child survivors of the human race. When she switches into aggression mode, which happens pretty early on, she's terrifying. But as a robot trying to deal with children in an increasingly hostile environment, she's also very pitiful and easy to sympathize with as at all at times but i can't read anymore yeah um i'm really enjoying raised by wolves as well it's a really fun series that's ridley scott matt um and his never-ending quest to understand humanity yeah because ridley scott is himself a robot and so that's he's just trying to understand humanity yeah he's doing a lot for replicant rights as a replicant himself Mm -hmm. (laughs) um yeah no i really want to watch that show it's good fat bears 621 says the ones that scare me the most are the ones that aren't actually malevolent mustache twirling computers are just another type of person with motives and reasoning the tech that scares me is the unthinking unreasoning type that is just carrying out its programming and isn't vulnerable to intimidation or pleading or even riddling my favorite version that's been presented in prose is the mysterious ai from the expanse series there are a couple of chapters that are told from the pov of the ai and it's like reading scrolling output text There's no anger or frustration, no sense of accomplishment or pride, just inhuman, something totally alien and incapable of being interested in humans or of being interested in anything other than following its coding. Um, Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, I I think if we weren't two hours and 30 minutes into the show, Matt would have a lot more to say about AI because AI is something that you have a lot to say about, Matt. Yes, uh, it's one of my special interests. Maybe we will uh, carve out a section next week on that since yeah. we got so many AI characters in these books. All right. We have I Like Comfy Sneakers, who says my favorite malevolent AI is AM, Allied Master Computer, from I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream by Harlan Ellison. Post-apocalyptic AM, which has acquired godlike powers, toys with the remaining survivors like a child looking down on bugs. I don't want to st- spoil the story in case you haven't read it, but AM takes particularly cool revenge on one character that would horrify anyone. I remember it being a relatively short, maybe a 20-minute read. Yeah, I want to read this. Um, oh, I haven't read this story. Oh, God. Yeah, it's a, it's one of those classics where you're like, oh, okay, I'm permanently scarred by this. Yeah, I think three people gave this answer, so I cool. clearly need to go read this thing. Yeah, yeah. Lynette B says, again, the AI from Harlan Ellison's story, I Have No Mouth and On My Scream, has remained etched in my mind since I had to read the work for, for a class over 20 years ago. Disturbing does not even begin to cover it. Awesome. Yep. Um, Darian Tiro says for the discussion question, my choice is the frame in Arion's album, the source. It's not exactly a novel concept for sci-fi being a system put in place to enhance the lives of the humans that made it, but then deciding that the best course of action is to eradicate those same humans. The method by which it chooses to destroy them, however, is well metal. It shuts the entire plant down the entire planet systems and allows its core to melt down resulting in a quantum supernova that obliterates the planet but not before a group of people get off planet mutating themselves in something be- as into something beyond human in the process with a drug called liquid eternity in order to live indefinitely and find a new planet an ocean world on which on which they settle the frame however smuggles itself aboard aboard in the programming of an android they brought with them and this ends up being setting up a story that spans a total of seven albums including the one i've described here the movie music is consistently excellent and the story is just cool this is an album this is a metal (laughs) album that tells that story (laughs) holy shit Uh, i love i love metal in principle (laughs) Uh, all right that's fun unplucked gem says hal 9000 he was the first and the best there have been countless ripoffs after 2001, but he was the original. I can still hear his annoying, calm voice. I'm sorry, Dave. 
I'm afraid I can't let you do that. Creepy as hell. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, Puller420 also says, Hal 9000, the sheer ter terror of not only being at the mercy of a dread robotic creation, but also in outer space with absolutely no way to escape is pure fear. Yes, it's great. Yes. So good. Uh, we here at the Doofcast think 2001 is a great movie and will not hear anything else yeah, we will about it. Brooke, no argument. Yes. Uh, next, we have Para Jane, who picks a character from Buffy, who I don't want to spoil because I'm going to make you watch Buffy, Matt, and I don't want to spoil anything. But there is a malevolent uh, robot character in that story um, that we will talk. Perfect. About. I love those. I, I agree with you, Jane. What a character and what a performance. But I just don't want to spoil it for Matt. But uh, one day, one day we'll get you there, Matt. Awesome. Fatty Kruger says mine is going to be President John Henry Eden from Fallout 3. Eden is a sentient Zach's series supercomputer and president of the Enclave, a shadow government organization. Eden wanted to use the water purifier to wipe out all mutated life, including humans, in the, Potom in the Potomac River Basin so the Enclave could control the area. Mass genocide in exchange for Washington, D.C. Um, and then they say, but then maybe I just love the Fallout games. You mean Microsoft's Fallout games? Is, is, that, is that a thing now? Yeah, Microsoft bought uh, Bethesda for seven point five billion dollars. Wow! So you know, that's more than Disney spent on Star Wars. Good for Bethesda. Probably, probably not actually. <laughs> <laughs> good for Microsoft. Yeah, probably <laughs> not good for gamers. <laughs> um, next, we have Drew Dandelion, who says favorite a AI turned bad by far. By far are the Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. I'm a huge fan of the OG series, but the way they expanded in the new series with the skin jobs and the series Caprica, the prequel before it was unfortunately canceled. I don't want to spoil the back, but Caprica really expands on the why from the very beginning. These man-made slave machines were doomed to turn on their creators and yearn for free will. If you can't, if you can handle the disappointment of a midway cancellation, I highly recommend it. If you do watch Battlestar Galactica first, I've watched Battlestar Galactica. I really love it. I, I've not gotten into Caprica. I think I tried once and bounced off of it, but I, I should, I should give it another try. I've heard so many good things about this, especially from our Australian partners. Um, yeah, you need to watch Battlestar Galactica, man. You, I will. I will. It'll go on the list. Yeah, it's uh, just you and TV. It's so hard. I, I know. There's so much TV. I know. Uh, Jezza Beelzebub says, uh, hands down, Vicky from Small Wonder. She wasn't <laughs> supposed to be malevolent, but I never felt right about her. She was like the Swiss Army knife of robots. She could be a vacuum cleaner or nuke your food for you. Or blow freezing cold air. I think I remember one episode where she could fly, and I'm certain she had some kind of laser beam action. And of course, <laughs> she had robot strength, so she could bend rebar or crush boulders. I mean, now I understand that the show was just really badly written and stupid, but when I was a kid, all I knew was that Vicky was a robot who could do anything. <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't watched this show. I don't know what this is. See, here's the, the, one of the things I love about doing this show is I think the age group of our average listener on this show skews a little older than it does on some of our other shows, especially on the worm and ward stuff. Um, so we get answers like this from people. Small wonder was a, uh, a, a sitcom in the eighties. I think it ran like mid to late eighties. Um, it was, I watched it. It was so fucking weird. Like I don't, like TV was so different in the eighties, y'all. Like <laughs> this was just like, what if we had the sitcom where one of the, the where there's a girl and she's just a she's just a robot and she lives with this family and that's the sitcom. It sounds genius. It's, <laughs> it's just wild, just wild. Oh my god, I, I love this. I love it so much. Um, next up, we have complicated nine five nineteen who says my top answer would have to be Cortana. Cortana from the Halo video game series. She's pretty badass and reliable until she degrades into a corrupted state in the last couple of games. Just like Microsoft. <laughs> it's a metaphor. <laughs> uh, a AI 84001. I that's that's the best I can do. Uh, they say best that they say, given the context, it would be criminally negligent not to extend an honorable mention to Yul Brynner's Gunslinger from the original Westworld. Brynner, Kala Bryn Sturgis. It's all 19, baby. <laughs> I say, but my real vote goes to the skin jobs from Philip K. Dick's masterpiece, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? 
Dick set the table and everyone else has just been rearranging the plates ever since. Varying shades of Dick's ideas about what makes us human and whether an AI has the potential to come close can be found in our favorite insane train, Blaine. And of course, your friendly neighborhood messenger robot, Andy, many other functions, wouldn't have quite as many layers of potential moral ambiguity without the work of old horse lover fat. <laughs> cool. Good point. Yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. I, you know, I, for somebody who loves the Blade Runner, quote, franchise as much as I do, I really need to read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep specifically. Oh, wow. I didn't know you hadn't read that. Yeah, go read yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, Matt said words, goes back to HAL 9000 says is their gold standard from malevolent ais is embedded and crucial role to the crew in 2001 a space odyssey makes the betrayal to the crew gut-wrenching the cold sterile and unprecedented setting for hal's decision to remove the crew seems like something an ai would do in the situation making it all the more terrifying also honorable mention goes to the cylons of battlestar galactica there's another battlestar galactica nod for you matt yep 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 I can't drive 69 says I'm going to have to go with T 1000. He is absolutely relentless and single minded in his pursuit. There's no grand plan behind those eyes. He has only one mission and he will see it through. There's no reasoning or bargaining with him. And there's no situation imaginable that will make him give up his chase. Is there anything scarier? Also the scene where he comes up from the floor was pure nightmare fuel for a young mind in the days before CGI became commonplace. Yes, I love T one thousand. I the thing I especially love about T one thousand is that he there are small moments where he seems to be enjoying doing what he's doing. Yeah, and it's yeah. not it's not everywhere, but every once in a while, there's a little moment where he's he's being a little bit more sadistic than he needs to be, and that actually makes it scarier than if he was just consistently sadistic. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I mean. Like that that's the, the great thing about T1000 as a character is like yeah like it there, he doesn't get a lot of character like direct characterization but like the fact that he loves being that same cop guy like I know mm. for practicality standpoint that's like they hired an actor to play the T1000 and he needs to go back to that form because that's the actor yeah. they hired but like like removing the the dualistic reasoning like he is returning to this form because he likes it yeah. and 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 that's it it's just he's 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 continuing to be a cop because he likes it yeah and and it's just it's great i love it so much me too i yeah i watched that movie again recently love that movie so much mm -hmm. ataraxieri says i think my favorite is still blaine the riddling train i love that he wasn't evil exactly just old as hell bored beyond belief and simply going a little crazy how human yeah i think that's all of us in quarantine right now yeah you guys want to play a riddling game? Please yeah. give me something to do. Yeah, some any new riddles? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Steven Youth says they're going to go with the alien robots in They Live. These robots have inserted themselves and taken over the planet. No, they don't wipe out the humans. Instead, they they uh, what they did was bribe them and make them rich to use our planet as a spaceport as they began using global warming to make Earth more like their own planet and are depleting Earth's resources for their own gain. I've always loved Roddy Piper's realization that something is really wrong when he puts on the sunglasses and begins to see messages everywhere from billboards down to uh, down to the money that says this is your God. It's one of my favorite sci-fi movies of all time with one of the best soundtracks. You just can't beat that Carpenter music. Yep. I, it's a good movie. Have you seen that movie? I don't think I've seen it all the way through. I think I've seen parts of it. Cool. Cool. Up next, we have Dark Gazing who says, does synths count? I feel like synths count. So I picked Ash, the scientist from Alien. You get the sense that he isn't just acting on orders. He's genuinely fascinated by the alien and admits he admires it. Like Andy, he had a job to do, but it feels like there's something more malevolent there under the surface, a disdain for the more boring life forms that make up his crew. Not only is he actively murderous when discovered to be the imposter, you said you're going to play Among Us this weekend, so you'll get that by then, <laughs> but revels in the fact that the crew's odds are slim to none, dies smiling too. Complete dick. <laughs> Yes. yes god you have my hey, sympathies man. yes i love yeah. him yeah yeah hey ridley scott you sure write a lot about robots yep. for a human he's trying to tell us something <laughs> um luke v says uh i'd be very surprised if this character isn't mentioned multiple times but my favorite it would be glados from the portal games she not only has all the traits of a fantastic evil mad ai such as her disregard for humanity and the various emotions that come along with it but she also is truly funny and has an actually sympathetic backstory um yeah um 
Kill Matt, him. play Portal 2. I, 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 I will. <laughs> I will. Do it. Okay. Read the quote. I know you wanted to read the quote. Killing you and giving you good advice aren't mutually exclusive. <laughs> God, I love Portal. Um, Rebecca B says, my absolutely favorite stories of malevolent robots come from the Mass Effect video game series. Slight spoilery. The first is the Geth, which was an AI species that was essentially good. However, their creators were paranoid about them trying to eradicate organic species, so they tried to get the jump on them by turning them off. Threatening the Geth's existence, however, started a war between man and machine, thus triggering what people didn't want in the first place. There are also the Reapers, and there's one AI called EDI um, in Mass Effect series, and I'm not going to go into everything Rebecca said, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fun AI characters in those games. I love those games, too, so much. And I think the ending of the third one was absolutely fine and did not need to be changed. Stop complaining about it, gamers. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah. The end. Yeah. I don't know anything about this. <laughs> little, little Metal Pixie says, gotta be Bender from Futurama. Not sure you consider him malevolent so much as a friendly menace, but still. Um. You know what? I actually love that answer because Bender is not a good person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, not. He's definitely not. The, the show is very consistent about having Bender never actually be a good person. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'm I'm surprised no one mentioned Lore. Lore is my oh. is one of my favorite malevolent AIs. Interesting. He's very complicated, though. Yes, that's true. I don't know what mine would be. I hadn't thought about this. I mean, I don't know if Lore is my favorite, but I, I, I do think Lore is a great character. But mm-hmm. speaking of twinning, I mean, it's worth pointing out. Lore is Lore is the other is the the previous version of Data that has emotions, but he went crazy mm-hmm. because he couldn't handle the emotions from Star Trek. Anyway, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, did you, I've been watching the original Star Trek? Do you think like the Next Generation? They were just like, hey, we need another cold calculating character but we can't just do another vulcan so they just made data like you think that's what yeah they decided i think they i think they wanted to copy the formula as closely as possible but they but they didn't want to just do another vulcan but just not so yeah they made, and, so they made the best character ever yeah and, and then instead of but they were like but we've got to have an alien but this time it's going to be a klingon and yeah yeah etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah man the klingons in the original series did not look like the klingons in the next generation yeah they were just dudes yeah. <laughs> with beards yeah <laughs> i you know have you, have you seen the deep space nine episode where they go back in time and they see what the klingons look like and Worf is there and they're like no. and they're like they're like Worf, what the hell and, and Worf <laughs> and Worf goes we do not discuss it with outsiders <laughs> Oh God, I love Star Trek. Hey, we can't. We have to end this okay. episode, though. Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, next week we are not having a discussion question because next week is our overview episode. We're going to be looking back on Book Five and talking about all the broad themes, talking about everything we liked over the course of the story, and really just trying to wrap it up in one big conversation. Um, And when we do those episodes, we also do a mailbag, which means this is your opportunity to ask us questions. Ask us anything you want. uh, Try to keep it about maybe Stephen King, maybe. But you don't have to. If you want to be just random questions, we talk about random shit on this this podcast enough that you can just be random questions. But um, send those in. You can email us. You can respond on the Twitter thread or you can send them in uh, our subreddit as well. So send us your mailbag questions and we will answer them next week. That's right. Um, yeah, like Scott said, send those to kingslingerspod at gmail.com uh, at kingslingerspod on Twitter or the subreddit. Yep. And if you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, come on, folks, this is episode 38. It's time now. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and like anywhere else, like basically everywhere, everywhere there are podcasts will be will be there. He's right. Uh, and if you like this show and you want to support it, consider donating to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash doof media. Uh, this week, special thanks to new patrons, uh, uh, Bidoof's David, Flower Priest, and Olafak, new Doof Dancer, Crossland Shaw, and new Doof Trooper, Tally Ron. We really appreciate yep. y'all. Thank you. Gosh, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, we've got tons of great bonus content and things we're working on behind the scenes. So um, we think 
at every level you can donate to us, there's something exciting that you'll get. So thank you to those uh, who agreed with that and and donated some money. We are totally patron funded, so we really do appreciate it. And of course, if you cannot afford to donate, that is okay. You can help us out by sharing this podcast with everyone and anyone. Um, we we've like gotten a lot of interaction on our Twitter lately and it's been really fun. So thank you to everyone who's reaching out to us and interacting with, with us at Kingslinger's pod. That's it's so much fun. There's like a, a Sunday Stephen King thread that, that uh, a person tags us in every Sunday now. And it's, it's really fun. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the Kingslinger's Twitter experience. Cool. Um, so thanks to everyone who's participating in that. Uh, and if you, if you can, you can help us out by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, or your podcatcher of choice. This week's spotlight review comes from Joe Meebs, who gives us five stars and says, keep it up. I never read a multi-book fantasy series before. I happened upon the whole series when an extra copy of it was sent to a family member who was unable to return it. Ka? I'm currently on book three. The podcast has been the best help and not only getting through the writing I have never experienced before, but also understanding and really taking in the story for the first time. Keep up the good work, fellas. That's so cool. I love this is like two weeks in a row now. It's been someone who's reading the series for the first time and following along with us. That's that's great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you to everyone who takes the time to send in those ratings and reviews. Uh, as I say every week, they really, really do matter. Um, it's how Apple Podcasts like... F- their algorithm it, more reviews the better basically the more likely people will see it when they search for things so thank you so much folks um that's it for us this week finally the longest episode we've done so far my god how did this happen uh, we will see you here next week when we talk big big about wolves of the Cala. long days and pleasant nights may you have twice the number. Mm-hmm.